Well, it is 7.33 p.m. on Tuesday, November 23rd, 2021. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I would like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Uh, Sean O'Rourke. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. I am here as well. Uh, Kevin Mills is unavailable uh, to us this evening, and uh, Stephen Revelak uh, had resigned at the end of our prior hearing uh, to join the ARB. Uh, so recogn uh, recognizing town officials, uh, Rick Vallarelli, our board administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Vallarelli. And uh, Vincent Lee assisting yeah. us as often. Thank you very much, Vincent. And I don't think Kelly Lynham is with us this evening from the Department of Planning and Community Development, which she is, assists us in many other ways. Um, <clears throat> so appearing on behalf of 83 Palmer Street, uh, Robert and Nessie, are you here? I am there here. You are. Yes. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, appearing for 1618 Swan Place, uh, is Mr. Potter available? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Perfect. Good to see you. You as well. Thank you. Uh, appearing for 25 Highland Avenue. I'm not sure who's representing them this evening. Olga is here. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And then appearing for 137 Robin Road, I think uh, Zhizhao is here. Let's see the name. Hello, this is a G. It's for the 137 Robins Road. Yep. Perfect. Just making sure you're here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order yeah, suspending certain true. provisions of the open meeting yes. law, you which suspended to. the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may continue to meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, other participants are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. This chair reserved the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. <clears throat> As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. <clears throat> Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotony, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. We will begin this meeting. Um, item number two on our docket, which is the approval of the decision for 31 Melvin Road. So this was a case that the board heard on November 9th. Um, Mr. Hanlon has prepared a very thorough set of uh, written copy of the decision that was distributed to the board for comments. And I know some com some have um, <clears throat> submitted comments and they have been incorporated and it was reissued this afternoon. Are there any further um, comments on the decision for 31 Melvin Road? 
Seeing none, uh, may I have a motion to approve the final written decision for 31 Melvin Road? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, so a vote on that. Uh, Roger DuPont? Aye. Patrick Hanlon? Aye. Uh, Mr. Mills is not with us this evening. Um, and the chair votes aye. So those, that final written decision is approved. Um, and so Rick, if you can go ahead and prepare that for a signature by the board. Well done, Mr. Chairman. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, this brings us up to the next item on our docket, which is uh, item number three, docket number 3658, 83 Palmer Street. Um, and so I will invite uh, Robert Anessi to go ahead and address the board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to be with you this evening, uh, gentlemen. Uh, this is a matter that uh, came before the board uh, some time ago, uh, and uh, it's coming before the board now in a new guise. Uh, we have uh, uh, applied for a special permit uh, just uh, to summarize the uh, history of this particular property, uh, it was the subject of a zoning Board of Appeals case back in 1955. And in 1955, this particular lot was created uh, by the Zoning Board of Appeal in a zoning decision. Uh, and the uh, lot that was created uh, 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 contained 5,504 square feet. Now the zoning bylaw at that time uh, required 6,000 square feet with respect to uh, the requirement for a, a square feet on a lot. So I think we can in infer that the members of the zoning board knew, and actually they said it in their decision, uh, that the lot did not have enough square feet to in fact comply with the then requirement of 6,000 square feet in the zoning bylaw. The other interesting uh, point of, uh, about the property at that point in time was that it was then as it is now in an R2 zone. And most of the properties in the neighborhood of uh, the site were in fact two family homes. There are some singles, but uh, most were two family homes. Uh, when the zoning board uh, uh, rendered their decision, they did not actually make specific findings of fact uh, as we do today, as we've done for many years. Uh, they did not say, for example, uh, we are allowing the subdivision and we're allowing the subdivision uh, so that the lot, uh, lot B, that's the lot we're talking about, uh, would in fact uh, be a, a two family or a single family lot. They didn't say that one way or another. What we do know is that at that time uh, and now, uh, the lot uh, was in fact in a R2 zone. Now, there was no building on that lot. Uh, another lot had been created as part of that subdivision. The other lot had 4,582 square feet. And that lot did in fact have a building on it. It had, had a single family home, home on it. What happened subsequent to the zoning decision was that a single family home and uh, not a two family home was constructed on lot B. We now rapidly come forward to today, and uh, I have a client who basically would like to construct a duplex home on lot B. And uh, his position is that uh, he should be allowed to do that uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the uh, points I would like you to uh, focus on uh, is uh, the new accessory bylaw, by the way, uh, that was just passed by town meeting and uh, I'm, I'm told recently approved by the attorney general, which now allows 
uh, a, a homeowner in an R1 zone who might have a shed on their property to convert that shed to uh, living quarters. That was never the case before. It is the case now. It also allows homeowners uh, to, uh, now we're talking about existing buildings, okay? Uh, a homeowner to put an addition on a building uh, in an R1 zone uh, and create an, an extra living unit as well. Now, the whole point of that is that there's a recognition uh, certainly on the part of town meeting, which is our local legislative body, that we want to have more residen uh, residential units in the town. Well, uh, by creating a duplex on the lot, that in fact is what would happen. We would now have two units on that lot. We take down that single family home and we'd construct two du uh, uh, a duplex on that lot. Uh, we have, I have with me uh, this evening, Dan Cameron, who's a registered land surveyor who did the site plan. I also have with me John Carney, who is the contractor who can address any issues with respect to the building plans themselves. Uh, I would suggest to the members of the board, as I did in my zoning memo, that we essentially comply with the requirements of the uh, zoning bylaw uh, with respect to dimensional uh, matters, uh, with respect to open space, uh, landscaped, usable, uh, and other matters as well. Uh, one of the matters that, ha that have been raised by neighbors, by the way, uh, was that they were not really enamored of seeing a sunken driveway uh, at the property. That is something that we had in fact considered initially. Uh, once we heard from the neighbors that they did not really like that idea, we modified our plans. And uh, as you can see from our plans, the site plan pre prepared by the registered land surveyor, we're going to have surface parking and not sunken parking. Uh, and uh, I, the neighbors, uh, I believe, wrote a letter to the zoning board and basically said, we don't object to, they put it on the basis of uh, a change of zone to R2. Well, it already was an R2. The whole issue is whether in fact my client can construct a duplex on the lot. I'm going to uh, have the, uh, the board uh, open up any questions they may have for uh, Mr. Cameron. But before we get to that, uh, I'm gonna suggest to you that with respect to the uh, special permit requirements, I've covered those in my memo at the very end of my memo, uh, uh, all of them. And I believe that we do satisfy all of them. Uh, the duplex that we're proposing fits in nicely in the neighborhood. The photographs that were given to you uh, by the neighbors show uh, other homes, two family homes in the neighborhood and the duplex we're proposing fits in very nicely with those homes. With respect to the zoning decision that today would be defective because there were no uh, findings of fact that should have been made, uh, my position on that is that the board uh, now can in fact deal with the matter, deal with the matter on the basis that we're complying with the zoning bylaw uh, with respect to dimensional and all of the other items. The only item that I fall short on uh, would be uh, the 6,000 square feet. We do not have 6,000 square feet. I'm suggesting to the members of the board that they can in fact grant relief by way of a special permit. And by the way, we don't even know whether the subdivision that occurred in 1955 was by way of a special permit or a variance because none of the documents filed, uh, the paperwork at that time indicate whether it was a special permit or a variance. So therefore, I am operating on the basis 
it was a special permit. And so there I'm before the board this evening asking them to grant relief by way of a special permit and not by way of a variance. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, the board if they have any questions for uh, Mr. Cameron first, uh, first on the site plan portion of the, uh, of the uh, uh, property. Uh, and once we deal with that, uh, any questions the board may have for Mr. Carney with respect to the building plans can be addressed as well. By the way, we're only up two and a half stories. We're not a three-story building here. We're two and a half stories and not three. Uh, do any members of the board have any questions for Mr. Cameron? Um, Mr. Anthony, I'm gonna go ahead and put up that landscape plan on the screen. Yep. So this is the current landscape plan, is that correct? The one that just went out to you? Yes. yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. So before we get to the surveyor and to the contractor, I actually have some questions for uh, Mr. Anessi mm -hmm. uh, with regard to mm -hmm. the application, the petition itself. Mm -hmm. So are we okay to go there, Mr. Chairman? Certainly. So the notice itself actually casts this as an appeal from the decision of the building inspector. And, and I realize uh, that this gets a little complicated and we've seen these before where we literally have a decision by the board in 1955 that says neither of the lots comply with the zoning requirements. And, and I always find that puzzling as well in terms of, well, what was the basis? Was it a special permit or variance? as you have just uh, alluded to. So we really don't know. So I guess the first question is, if this is being cast as a, an appeal from the decision of the building inspector, I, I know we don't actually get written decisions from the building inspector, but I'd like to know a little bit more about what the basis for the, uh, the denial was, and I'm not sure, perhaps Mr. Valorelli knows. I think Mr. Champ is also, uh, at least I saw his name. So that would be important for me to try to assess what it is that we are dealing with here. And I, and I would just add that I think maybe the other way to ask the question is, uh, what would what's preventing this uh, from being a build as a right uh, situation. And I know you've already said it's under the 6,000 square feet. So I, I just want to know sort of what the lay of the land is, both figuratively and uh, literally, uh, so that you know, I, I know what it is that's being asked of us. I, I, Mr. Chairman? Yep. Yes, sir. Could I, is it, I won't, I don't want to enter, get in between Mr. Uh, DuPont and Mr. Nessie's answer, but I, do want to remind the board that we had a number of questions about the sort of uh, what to make of the decision that was made in 1955, given all of the defects and explanation that we had, and that uh, Mr. Revelak and I took that to uh, uh, Mr. Heim uh, to ask his view, uh, and to the extent to which that seems to be relevant after Mr. Anessi's answer or later on at the convenience of the board, um, I can fill you in on what Mr. Heim told me. Uh, I, I can add to that, uh, if I could, uh, Mr. Chairman. Certainly, please. Uh, Mr. Heim and I did uh, have a discussion about this, uh, and we had talked about uh, many of the undersized lots down in East Arlington, uh, and that uh, uh, maybe some thinking might be uh, might go into what could be done about some of those undersized lots. That having been said, uh, Mr. Heim said to me, uh, Bob, I suggest to you that what you do is you file uh, again with the zoning board and you file for a special permit. Now, Mr. DuPont, with respect to your issue, I think that what you find with the building department, and I think rightfully so, is a concern on their part when they see a decision from a 1955 Zoning Board of Appeal that basically uh, doesn't make findings of fact as we would have today. 
So with that, I think that uh, the, the building department representatives would say, look, I don't think I should decide this at my level. I think maybe this should be decided at an appellate level. And the appellate level, of course, is the Zoning Board of Appeal. So that probably is the reason why it's before the Zoning Board of Appeal right now. I would have preferred, quite frankly, that it got, the issue be dealt with uh, at the lower level, but that isn't the way my experience is that it's done, Mr. Dupont, unfortunately. May I follow up, Mr. Chair? Uh, absolutely. So what I'm trying to get a handle on then is, are we talking about a, a no decision by the building department, which says we're not deciding this, uh, go to the Board of Appeals, or are we, are we dealing with a decision which is a denial, uh, which is you know an affirmative denial, if you will, express denial, if you will. So so because if you know generally speaking, the building inspector will issue a permit if the if the uh, project is in conformity with zoning. And so if there is an express denial, you would think then that there is a reason tied to the zoning bylaw as to, the, as to why it's being denied. If on the other hand, it's no more than I can't decide that, go to the Board of Appeals. That's an important distinction for me to know uh, so that I can sort of assess this from a different perspective. Maybe Mr. Valerelli has a different opinion than I do, but I think it's the second uh, point, uh, uh, Mr. Dupont, that is that the building department did not feel that based upon the 1955 zoning case, they had enough information to decide the issue. This is almost like, a, Roger, you would understand this, almost like a complaint for declaratory judgment, okay? Uh, it's being sent to the zoning board by the building department saying, you should decide this because we can't. I actually have the inspector, uh, the director of inspectional services is asking to be recognized. I think at this point, it's probably prudent to do so. Uh, Mr. Champa? Good evening. Um, hi, Mike Champa, director of inspectional services. Um, so I, I actually read the decision and then like today, um, it was beyond the authority of the building department to be able to issue a permit for a new home on that lot because then like today, it was an undersized lot. So it had to go before the zoning board. Thank you for that. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, I wondered if Mr. Annette, the, ordinarily what happens when you get an appeal from the zoning administrator is that the zoning administrator has the authority to do a certain thing and is and, and fails to do it uh, for reasons which uh, are being challenged. Uh, and then it comes to us and we decide whether the, they have the authority to do that or not. Uh, it isn't common for us to issue a special permit for which apparently there's not an application. Um, and I'm, I'm just a little bit unclear. At, usually the answer would to, to the answer to the appeal of the zoning uh, of the, of the uh, uh, building inspector would be you're wrong. But in that case, the building inspector can do, I mean, Building inspect, if the building inspector is as I think the building inspector is right, that he cannot grant a, 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 a building permit for this property because it doesn't comply with the zoning ordinance. Um, it clearly doesn't comply with the zoning ordinance. Everybody admits that because it's an undersized lot. So it needs to have some relief from that in one way or another. And uh, what Mr. Heim suggested is that the appropriate way of getting that relief is for him to apply to us for a special permit, in which case we can apply the standard factors that always apply to that, and then grant us a special permit. Um, and having it come to this in this, 
so that wouldn't have required anything other than an application to us. Uh, and we could have decided at that point, maybe that Mr. Heim is wrong and that's not our interpretation of the ordinance or whatever. But now that it's come to us in the form of an appeal, if we agreed that in fact, we could issue a special permit in order to grant this relief, um, we don't have a, we don't, I mean, do, so Mr. Nessie, how, how is it that instead of that we give you the relief that you want, if it's not, if, if we don't have a formal proceeding for a special permit, or is there a subsidiary uh, application that we can glom onto? Well, I think you do have that. You have a, a an application for a special permit. Uh, basically, the building department uh, has basically sent us to the Zoning Board of Appeal. And Mr. Heim suggested uh, that what I do is I file an application for a special permit. That's exactly mm -hmm. what I've done. So this is, so in effect, uh, I'm not quite sure in terms of the notifications, but I'm not quite sure that the appeal from the decision of the building inspector has much bearing on the way in which we consider the case just because uh, uh, they were not able to grant to, to allow you to proceed and the entire issue really before us is whether you're entitled to get a special permit is that right say again <laughs> the the question of, of uh, uh, the questions that usually come up in terms of an appeal to the building inspector is uh, whether the building inspector was right. Here it clearly is right, and the only issue that is really before us has to do with the issue with whether or not you should be get a special permit. Is that right. correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. So as a part of the, uh, the package um, that's on the website identified as the ZBA package, it does include um, the original notice, which you know states that it's appeal from the building inspector, but it does include um, a request for a special permit for the town of Arlington as well. I know we've sort of drifted a little bit from where we had had started I, on it. Mr. Dupont, did you have anything further you had wanted to ask in regards to your original question? You're on mute again. Sorry, sir. <clears throat> Where I can do. Okay. Um, there you are. So as I look at the request, and and I realize that this is a little bit nettlesome, and and so it's a little of this and a little of that. But when I look, as you said, it was advertised as an appeal, but then there's actually a. Um, special permit request. And um, at the bottom of that, it says request a special permit in accordance with dimensional and parking information. And so what I'm trying to fathom is, I mean, we start out with Mr. Champa's statement, which is it's an undersized lot and therefore it was sort of beyond his authority. And if we're starting out at the place that there's an undersized lot, then it seems to me that we're requesting relief from the fact that it's less than 6,000 square feet. And usually dimensional uh, issues are approached by way of a variance for the reasons that we well know, the four criteria. Otherwise, when we deal with special permits, we're typically looking at a section of the bylaw such as you know, large additions, for instance, which say that you know, in this specific case, the board can grant a special permit. And, I, and I'm just not clear where we have an authority to, uh, to, to grant a special permit without language, which says in the case of a lot under 6,000 square feet, you know, fill in the blank. I don't know exactly what the language would be, but I just don't know of a specific reference that allows us to deal with the undersized lot in this particular situation. So that's where my concern and my uh, question lies. And I'm willing to listen to the rest of everything, but that's 
that's where I am at this point. If you and, operate on the basis that the original zoning decision in 1955, uh, whether right or wrong, uh, was uh, uh, a special permit decision, then I'm being consistent and Doug Heim was being consistent in telling me that I should file for a special permit, which I have done. I understand what you're saying, Roger. Uh, this is a very unusual situation. Uh, the unusual uh, part of this is that the zoning bo uh, board back in 1955 didn't tell anyone what they really were doing at the time. So I'm asking for relief from the current zoning board to, mm -hmm. to essentially uh, almost interpret what the zoning board back in 1955 did when they rendered that decision. Now, I don't know of any way to get a matter before a zoning board other than by filing mm -hmm an application for either a special permit or a variance. There's no other way of doing it. I just did, I did one in Sudbury, very similar to this. Uh, and uh, we, we, uh, I essentially argued in that case uh, to the Sudbury Zoning Board of Appeal, I understand this is not traditional in terms of what we're doing. And uh, I'm almost asking you to exercise some equity in terms of what you're doing. That's exactly what they did. Now, query whether they have the authority to do that or not, is, it, it, is it's up to them, but they granted the relief. This is a situation where, again, I understand that traditionally, if you don't have 6,000 square feet, but you have 5,000 some odd, and you're going for relief, you need a variance. But that's not what I was instructed to do. And that's not what I'm doing. And if you read my memo, I'm, try I'm trying to hang my hat on what the zoning board did not do back in 1955. What they did not do is they did not say that it was not a two family. They didn't say anything about that issue one way or another. Uh, my client needs relief at this point, and he can't go back to 1955 and ask those gentlemen what they really meant. They're not around anymore. You're around. That's why I'm before you at this point, trying to gain relief. Mr. Sherman, so one quick follow-up then. Had, sure. had they actually issued either a special permit or a variance, and they said that, what would your posture be here now? My posture here now would be that they acted on this in a special permit guise back in 1955. As since they did, and they knew that the, pro uh, that the property did not comply with the 6,000 square foot lot requirement, then I'm doing the very same thing now. I'm applying for a special permit when I know, and you know, that the property does not comply with the 6,000 square foot requirement. So in essence, are you looking at a modification of a special permit? I'm looking for relief from the point of view of uh, my position is that what they really meant to do, but they didn't do uh, was say that the property uh, could be an R2, could be a two family because it was in an R2 zone Everything around it was two families at the time. They didn't say anything one way or another. Uh, they talked about the fact that it was undersized. They all knew that. Now, if they meant to say you could not have a two family, then they would have said that. They would have said, we're granting relief, but we're granting relief only for a single family home and not for a two family home. They never said that. So that's why I'm before you at this point, because I can't go before them. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a question as to whether this is under the board can grant by special permit. Um, <clears throat> the 
our zoning bylaw has a lot of information about non-conforming uses and about non-conforming structures and it's very thin on non-conforming lots. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. This may be, I, I, this is the very same discussion that we had last time. And it's the very thing that we referred to uh, Mr. Heim. Uh, and the difficulty is that, you know, we, we're only just telling stories to ourselves when we say this was a variance or a special permit. There's no indication that there was even authority to create a special permit on an, on an undersized lot back in 1955. Clearly the law on variances is what it was then. They didn't say they were doing a variance and they couldn't lawfully have done one at the time. Um, and it, it's a perplexity that we referred to, to the town council um, in part because they did this all the time. We had a similar case on 64 Brattle in which they created a non-conforming lot and it didn't seem to bother them. Whereas today we would not do it and we would not believe that we have the authority to do it. Um, so there are a lot of legal doctrines that might be used to try to deal with this, what from today's point of view is an anomalous situation. We could try to put this into the format of prior non-conforming uses and it's not really a prior non-conforming use, but maybe the fact that it was created by the ZBA at that time means that similar rules should apply. Um, and there may be other options, but the one that Mr. Heim settled on is the one that Mr. Anessi is asserting now, that the way to deal with the kinds of questions that are being created by this is not to get into rarefied discussions, but to treat it as if, just treat it as a special exception application. And it's not really rooted in the notion that this was in fact a special, uh, a, 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 a special permit situation back then it's rooted in the notion that this is the most practical way to get at a common practice in the 50s and 60s of creating lots that today could not be created by the board or anyone else really um, the law has changed a lot since the, that period of time and we need to figure out a way of dealing with it the mr heim was was influenced to some degree by the fact that uh, as anomalous as this situation is, the, the rules that give the ZBA the most, the greatest degree of discretion in figuring out what to do, and that leads us to be hoisted by our home petards last, um, is to treat it as a special, um, to treat it as a, as a special permit application, and then to apply what today's standards would be to apply a special permit application. Um, later, you'll find that I completely disagree with Mr. Anessi that the question here has anything to do with whether it's one or two houses on this lot, but that really isn't as important as knowing what legal framework we're in. And I think if the board really is, is feels uncomfortable with the special, uh, with the town council's determination, which was really based on quite a lot of research into doing into the situations in which this happened in the past, um that we should ask him to give us a formal letter rather than just uh, than just rather than than rely uh, on me to convey his sentiments to you uh, but i think that mr anessi uh, is acting on the base of the basis of, as the advice that he got in a separate conversation uh with town council after town council had spoken to me thank you for that mr hanlon i I think possibly what this comes down to um, is under 813B in the in the zoning bylaw. So essentially what we have, we have a we have a non-conforming lot, but we have a non-conforming building on a non-conforming lot. Um, and it, as um, Mr. Hanlon had pointed out, we had a prior case at 64 Brattle Street where um, an applicant had wanted to raise an existing structure and build a new structure um, that was conforming more conforming on the lot, but wanted to do it by right. And the board had <clears throat> had stated that that was not something that could be done by right, but it had to be done by, um, but it could be done by special permit. And we had at that time, if I remember correctly, we were looking at 813B, which 
states that no alteration, reconstruction, extension, or structural change to a single or two family residential structure that increases the nonconforming nature of said structure shall be permitted, unless there's a finding by the Board of Appeals that the proposed alteration, reconstruction, extension, or structural change will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And uh, that's usually a special permit determination. And this would be essentially a reconstruction. Um, Mr. Chairman. You know, in this case, it is not increasing the necessarily increasing the nonconforming nature of the structure, but it is a reconstruction of something that's a, existing as a nonconformity. And as such, this seems to imply that as a special permit, the board could um, could grant relief. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, in the 64 Brattle Street case, actually the issue there, we did we decided that it couldn't be done at all. And the mm. reason was because the question was what a, a reconstruction meant. And the, we took the position that was consistent with the long-term interpretation by ISD that a, re, that a reconstruction was something other than tearing the house down and building up a new one in its place. Uh, and that was the and that was the case that I'm not quite sure whether it's still in, in litigation or not. But the contention by the applicant in that case was that uh, fully tearing down the house was in fact a reconstruction. And since there wasn't any extension of the nonconformity, you didn't need a special permit. That was the argument yeah, in that case. Here, the, uh, it's possible that, that if the applicant had been right in 64 Brattle, the case before us would not even be before us. Um, and it really would be an appeal from a building inspector. Um, and again, I just want to stress that it, it is to avoid getting into difficulties like this of treating this as a, this isn't really as was true of 64 Brattle on prior non-conforming use at all. Um, and so, you know, we can go this way, but you have to realize that relying on 8.1.3b is something that raises lots of issues in town because of what the zoning board did back in those in those days um, and could have a pretty large impact on the community. And that's part of what Mr. Heim was looking at. So with, with that in mind, um, I'll turn to the, the, uh, the trained lawyerly ones in the on the board, how do we proceed on this? Mr. Chairman, I suggested before that that we ought to hear from Mr. Heim himself rather than hear say from me. And if this continues to be the issue from us, Mr. Heim has done the research. Uh, I believe that I've accurately uh, conveyed his conclusions, but I don't necessarily have the ability to convey all his reasoning. And um, I think we should ask for uh, for a letter from him to say in writing and maybe come before us and explain what what he thinks the legal framework is and what we have the authority to do. Would it would it make sense to uh, go through the hearing and hear from the uh, surveyor, hear from the contractor? so that you have all of that information. And hearing from Mr. Heim could kind of be like a condition subsequent. If Mr. Heim uh, uh, opines that uh, uh, it's something the board does have the authority to do, then I think at that point, uh, uh, at least you've heard the case. If he decides the other way, you've heard the case as well. Would that make sense? So certainly we could, we could proceed with the hearing um, knowing that at the end of the discussion we have this evening that the board is going to continue um, to receive counsel from town council. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just, just to make an observation, it's a practical matter. If in fact we treat this as a case that involves a prior non-conforming use and or some and in some way get around the reconstruction issue that we have. Um, the standard under 8.1.3b of not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood mm -hmm. is probably going to be something that is very close, in fact, to the standards that we'll be applying under the special permit so that we would not be wasting our time having a hearing on the merits 
regardless of what legal framework we ultimately decide should apply. Okay. So with that in mind, let's proceed um, with a with a hearing on this case because, you know, as Mr. Anessi had had noted, we do have a lot of people here present, not only. Um, on behalf of the applicant, but we do have a substantial number of people from the from the neighborhood who are here who would like to be heard as well. Um, so let's go ahead and do that um, on the presumption that the board is con would be looking uh, towards the criteria for a special permit, and then um, at the at the close of this hearing, rather than um, calling for a vote of the board, we would be continuing. Um, and then issuing a request from town council to issue um, written, either written guidance or um, appearance. The board's next scheduled hearing is December 21st. Um, and so I think we would be looking to continue to that date. Okay, uh, the, uh, as I had indicated uh, before we get into this uh, uh, part of the discussion, uh, if the board has uh, questions for Mr. Cameron, uh, mm -hmm. who is the surveyor, he's here to respond. Uh, and Mr. Carney is here to respond to questions with respect to the construction as well. Thank you. Um, so I did find there was there is a slightly revised version of the site plan relative to what I had provided earlier. Um, and so this one does include um, so I'm just going to reduce it a little so it fits better. Um, some additional notations that the application so that the it's a proposed two-family duplex style dwelling. They're requesting um, a driveway on the one side, and then they would need a special permit to request a second driveway on the opposite side. Um, they're proposing uh, what appears to be a foot and a half wide landscape buffer along both sides, which is a requirement um, under the bylaw. Uh, and they have a uh, large backyard space, uh, which is counts as usable open space um, to the point where the um, where the portion of the backyard is at least 25 feet um, in a specific direction. So um, at this end, it's at 23 and a half. So at whatever point it reaches 25 feet the, from there over, it qualifies as usable open space. Is there any question from the board about the site plan? If not, I'll switch over to the... Hearing none, I'll go ahead and pull up. Um, the drawing set. Um, Mr. Nessie, I don't know who you'd like to have speak to the plans. Uh, Mr. Carney, John, John, are you on? John Carney? Yep. Yep, I'm here. Good. He's on. Okay. Um, if you could just walk us briefly through the plans that are um, on the screen, and then I'll, I'll scroll by and we can talk on the elevations as well. So those are the interior floor plans. It's uh, basically kind of self-explanatory. You have a living area and a kitchen on the first floor, half bath, two bedrooms, a laundry, a bathroom, some closets on the second floor, and a master bedroom and uh, a master bathroom on the third floor. How about the basement, John? What's in the basement? Mechanical space. Okay, not living space, correct? No living space in the basement. All right. And uh, it's two and a half stories? Correct. All right. Yep. I was just going to ask that. So the, um, I'm not certain if the shaded area here represents specifically the area seven feet or greater um, or if it's at a different height, but. Correct. You're correct. It, re it represents that. Perfect. And as it states, um, so this year, you'll just need to confirm that the, so the, bon the zoning bylaw, it's not the portion of the floor area with a ceiling of seven foot three, it's actually seven foot zero, I think. Right. No. Right. No, yes. okay. no it's, the, it's the other way around. That's the same. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes. Um, 
want the elevations. Front, rear, and two sides. And what is the maximum height of the building? It's uh, like, it, it depends on the average grade there, but I'd say it's around 33 feet. Okay. Structural plans. It's a section. So, uh, don't correct. The section on the right hand side is the street side, and the left hand side is the rear yard. Correct. And that's the final sheet. At this point, are there questions from the board in regards to what the request is? Seeing none. Mr. Nassi, is there anything further you'd like to say on the plans? Hearing none. Okay. Mr. Chairman? <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering if somebody, <clears throat> I'm trying to look for it now, but if somebody could just say what the distance is between the two driveways. Switch back to that plan. <clears throat> so our front lot line is 60 feet. feet. So we're losing uh, basically 10 and a half off of each side. So we're losing 21 feet. So we're 39, 38 and change. Thank you. Um, I guess the one question I would have in regards to the site plan is um, the location of driveways on adjacent properties. Are they immediately adjacent? Are they farther away? Dan, are you on? Uh, yes, I am. Um, on this particular, on the um, northerly side of the left side, um, there's no driveway, but on the right side, uh, there is a driveway on the house that abuts Warren Street, and there is a driveway, uh, part, part of a driveway um, on number 93 Warren Street. Okay. And is, is that up on the lot line or is that farther away? On the, from my recollection, on the uh, 97 to 99 Warren Street, which is the property at the corner, it's further away. I okay. believe there's a grass strip, there's a garage there. And on the um, the property at 93 Warren, um, I don't believe the driveway comes all the way to the rear because it's you know it's coming in. It's, that's a, that's the rear line of that property. I think it ends you know before the fence, from my recollection. Okay. With that in mind, um, I'd like to open the. Uh, meeting for public comment. Um, so public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public are, will be granted time to ask their questions and make comments. The chair asks that those wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing to please be patient and allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead of them. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. And those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair, please. And remember to speak clearly. And once all pu public questions and comments have been addressed, uh, the co public comment period will be closed for this hearing. Uh, the board and staff will do our best to show what documents are being discussed. <clears throat> So are there 
I'll hit stop share on this for the moment. Are there members of the public who wish to be heard on this matter? Not seeing anybody. I'm flipping back and forth here. I'm not seeing the button for oh. requesting. Ah, the bigger part, it has moved. Thank you, Zoom, for updates. It is now hidden under the reactions tab. Beg your pardon. So those who wish to call the bond should raise their hand using the button under reactions. Very good. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Hazelton. We want to go ahead. Well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank the applicants for uh, taking into account the letter that uh, the community sent to the board. Uh, and, and, you know, it's obvious that this is in part responsive uh, to the concerns that were expressed in the letter. I guess what I'd really like to say is to ask a question of the board. And my question is, in, in defining what's quote unquote detrimental to the community, what weight, if any, would the Arlington design guidelines have in the board's mind? I mean, I guess my question is, are, are these significant, is that a significant document that means something or is, is that just sort of pie in the sky that some architects put together? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I mean, the design, the design guidelines are um, a set of guidelines that are intended to help developers and uh, those reviewing their plans to um, address neighborhood concerns and neighborhood patterns and development uh, within the town. Um, obviously, the design guidelines were, are, if your project is going through without review by the Zoning Board of Appeals, it does not apply. Um, the, the applicant is not required to abide by it, but by coming before this board, um, the board has some sway in terms of how it is applied. Um, and certainly up to this point, the board has not discussed it in regards to this particular, um, this particular application. Um, but that is certainly something um, that we will be discussing going forward. Are there specific um, points of the design guidelines that you would specifically like to reference? Well, I mean, I guess I, I understand where Mr. Aness is coming from in, in saying that we that they've been sensitive to the concerns that were expressed in the letter because probably 75% uh, of the itemized items refer to the, the park under feature. And so I just want to be clear that from our point of view, not having that is a, is a distinct improvement. So I, I, I want to be clear about that and not sound uh, churlish. Uh, the way I read the design guidelines, it's, it's not encouraging split driveways and 40 foot wide duplexes and it's encouraging consistency with the rhythm of the context, uh, which to my mind would be Palmer Street, which is, is mostly not duplexes. I think there may be one on the street, but I don't think it has a split driveway. Uh, so I, I don't think that the proposal as revised is adherent to the design guidelines, uh, but I do wanna acknowledge that it's, it's way more adherent than it was. And, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Uh, I just have a quick question regarding the calculation of the gross floor area. I think it's on the second page 
of the application. Um, now, the area underneath, that is a cellar, not a basement. Is that correct? That is correct. And I believe that cellar in a residential use, um, the entire area counts towards the gross floor area. So where it says 780 square feet, it probably should be 1,560 square feet. And that has implications as far as the calculation of the required open space, both usable and landscaped. Searching through the this open document uh, on the screen to come up with the document you're referencing. So just take your part on tracking it down. It's the part of the application that has the dimensional and information in it, the two tables. Here's the There we go. Is this the proper table? Yes, it would be on the uh, next page. Yeah, the gross floor area calculation. So this is uh, Dan. This is Dan Cameron. I can answer that. Um, <clears throat> it's excluding the mechanical area, as Mr. Connie said. So the uh, that's, act my understanding is that the mechanical area is excluded only in basement areas. In the cellar, it's the entire cellar used for residential uses. No, if you look at if you look at the second item where it says basement or cellar, greater than oh, five sorry. feet, I'll excluding mechanical area. You yes, but the bylaw only excludes the mechanical area for basements. It doesn't for cellars. I believe it's both. Okay, I have. Can you address that? Yeah, can I offer some insight here? Yes, Mr. Valerie. Uh, so again, the issue before the board tonight is um, whether they agree that the um, applicant has a buildable lot with insufficient frontage and insufficient lot area. These dimensional numbers we're looking at, th th this goes through a very rigorous process in ISD, along with 23 other regulations like uh, stormwater mitigation, the tree, and just so many, I kind of name them right now. So I think um, with all due respect and feel free to proceed if you like, this is putting the cart way before the horse. None of these numbers mean a thing right now. Um, that is not their issue. I think when the issue comes, if the board uh, agrees that this lot is buildable, uh, then uh, it's turned over to ISD from that point. Uh, again, it's just an insight um, in the interest of saving a little time. Uh, feel free to proceed if you like. Just thought I'd touch base on that. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, we, we eventually, I think, we one way or another are going to have to get, make a discretionary decision and whether or not this, these plans violate if we do, it will be subject to final plans, and these are the only final plans we have before us. And it would be relevant to us whether or not we're approving something that is violating the zoning bylaw. And we have to consider that. We wouldn't be able not to consider that. So with all due respect to Mr. Ballarelli, uh, I think we ought to understand at least what the rule is that's applicable to uh, uh, figuring out the uh, the, to what extent the square footage in the uh, cellar slash basement uh, applies. Is Mr. Seltzer right or not? That's that's what I really want Mr. Valerelli to tell me. Uh, so I can say this, any area, it depends on the ceiling height of the basement, uh, mechanical space is exempt in the basement or any other areas of the house. Uh, we would have to take a look at the, uh, the elevations with the ceiling heights and make a judgment from there. 
if I could refer you to the exact section of the bylaw to which I was making reference, it's 5.3.22 gross floor area um, part A. And it says the areas to be included in the calculation of gross floor area are basement areas, except as excluded in two below, and that's the reference to um, mechanical areas. And then the next item is sellers and residential uses without any exclusion uh, that is specified for basement. So basement and sellers do seem to be treated differently in terms of calculation of gross floor area. Um, again, ISD would look at the ceiling height. The ceiling height from the finished floor to the underside of the framing is uh, seven feet or greater. Uh, we would add that in as gross floor area unless it was a dedicated mechanical space. Well, I think, yeah, I think the point that Mr. Seltzer is raising is that by the, you know, by looking at the gross floor area definition in the bylaw, it does appear to imply that sellers and residential uses are to be included in, um, in their entirety and not proportionally. And I don't, um, but obviously the, the practice of the, the zoning, uh, excuse me, the practice of the inspectional services um, is not under the, it's not under the jurisdiction of the, the zoning board of appeals at this time. Uh, correct, Mr. Chairman. So uh, mechanical spaces have always been exempt. And that's, that is the practice of uh, ISD. Anything further, Mr. Seltzer? No, thank you. I just wanted to call that calculation to your attention and I'm sure you'll decide when to take it up. Thank you, sir, appreciate that. Are there additional questions from the public on this application? Seeing none, not seeing anyone waving frantically in their window. Go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing. At the... uh, so the board has received a, um, sort of a number of comments on a number of different points. Um, I think the, the, obviously the, the biggest and most relevant question right now is, is this lot buildable, uh, which is something that the board is gonna need um, input from town council on. Um, I think it's also important important to note that the you know there have been questions raised about the the size of the building and how that's that's properly calculated and also how the building is in compliance with the um excuse me with the the, the residential design guidelines and since we do have some time here um between tonight and when the board will be continuing this hearing to um i think it would be appropriate for, not only for the board to address to, uh, to request of, of council that we uh, receive a memorandum um, specific to this site, but that the board uh, should also take a look at uh, this property in regards to um, the residential design guidelines and possibly seek the advice of the, um, the planning department in that regards. And we have a planning department memo um, based on an earlier application, and I think it would be um, appropriate, and I can go ahead and, and speak with the Department of Planning and Community Development and see if they can um, provide us some guidance in regards to the application of the residential design guidelines um, for this property. And then we can when we reconvene um, at the next hearing, we can uh, discuss that as well. I, uh, I, I may I say something, Mr. Nessie, please. Yeah, I addressed the uh, criteria for a special permit in my memo, and that's what I think I'm supposed to address. I'll be more than happy to look at the design guidelines as well, but that's not contained in the uh, special permit portion of the zoning bylaw with respect to what I, as the attorney for the applicant, need to demonstrate to the Zoning Board of Appeal. 
Now, maybe you get into that uh, in an indirect way, but uh, there's nothing in the special permit portion of the zoning bylaw that incorporates those design guidelines. Uh, I need to look at the criteria, the seven criteria set forth in section 3.3 point whatever it is. Uh, that's, and that's what I've addressed in my, uh, uh, in my memo. One more thing. Uh, I just need the board to understand. I didn't do this application for a special permit on my own. I'm not on a frolic of my own, Mr. Hanlon. I did this because I was instructed and told to do it by Mr. Heim. Uh, I, I certainly would not have done it, okay, had I not been uh, uh, informed by Mr. Heim that this is the way I should proceed. I just want that on the record at this point, that uh, I'm not here wasting anyone's time. I did this because I was told to do it by town council. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Um, I, I just want to re-emphasize re that uh, that's exactly what I said, that Mr. Heim had had a conversation with Mr. Anessi where he conveyed that the right framework to deal with this is a yeah, special permit. And now we're asking him to have a conversation with us where I assume he'll tell us more or less the same thing. Um, so I certainly there's no implied depreciation of Mr. Anessi who's been enabling representing his client. If While I have the floor, I, I should just say that when it comes to the residential design guidelines, they come into the special criteria, the special uh, exception, special permit criteria uh, by way of criterion six, because we're looking at uh, compatibility with the character of the neighborhood. Uh, and those are guidelines that are designed to help us do that. And we use them in that way, not as rules that are enforceable, but as ways of enabling us to apply the rules that are enforceable. And applicants before us have recently been uh, quite, uh, overt in using those criteria and those guidelines as a way of, uh, of, of showing that they meet the rules that we're applying to them. And obviously any applicant can either ignore them or not, uh, but our history is that we have given them a considerable amount of credence when we've been applying the special permit, guide, permit requirements. We're certainly not ignoring them, Mr. Hanlon. We, we did, uh have them in mind when we uh, changed our sunken driveway to surface uh, 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 parking. That was one of the things we changed, uh, having heard from the neighbors, as the Mr. Hazelton indicated. So Mr. Nessie, I do appreciate that. Yep. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ork. I just want to concur that I do think it's a good idea to get the memo from town council, because as Mr. DuPont pointed out, and I think as Mr. Nessie knows, even though Attorney Heim said this, we can do this under a special permit, it would normally only be done under a variance. And just like we're looking back at this old decision from 1955 and saying, what, how and why did they do that? We should have something on the record for this decision as to why we didn't do it as a variance, if we're gonna go that way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So I just, when we request some guidance from Mr. Heim, I would just like, when I'm looking at the uh, section 3.3.1 special permit granting authority, I would like some clarification of the second sentence. It's a short paragraph. And it says that the appropriate special permit granting authority is specifically designated where applicable. And as I'd stated earlier to me that has always meant that there are provisions in the bylaw that say a special permit is uh, permissible under the following conditions and then there are specifics. And I realize that this is a completely different type of situation and we're gonna encounter it more and more in town. And perhaps it's something that the uh, you know, town meeting by way of a zoning amendment should address these types of situations, but I would at least like to have some sense as to how Mr. Heim views this case in light of that second sentence. Thank you. Thanks. 
as well. Okay. So I, I think at this point we're we sort of proceeded as far as we can, absent um, information from council um, in regards to uh, the, the property. And so I would, with the agreement of the applicant, uh, request a continuance on this matter until the next scheduled hearing of the board, which is uh, Tuesday, December 21st. So agreed. Thank you, Mr. Nessie. So with that, um, I move the continuance on the special permit application for, excuse me, 83 Palmer Street until Tuesday, December 21st at 7.30 p.m. Second. Thank you. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. The chair votes aye. We are continued. That. Uh, going back to our agenda. And, and thank you, Mr. Nessie, and, and, uh, and those who brought with you to uh, for appearing before us this evening. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is docket number uh, 3676, 1618 Swan Place. Um, for the purposes of this hearing, um, uh, board member Roger DuPont is recusing himself as he, um, as a professional matter, has some dealings with the family. Uh, so there are four members of the board who are able to proceed with this um, hearing at this time. So with that, I would uh, ask Mr. Potter to introduce himself and uh, tell us what he is asking to do. I'm Ben Potter. I live at 16 Swan Place. Uh, I am proposing, I, I currently have no parking, uh, off street parking. And it hasn't been an issue uh, because we hadn't had kids yet. Um, and then we had kids and we only had one, but actually our daughter was just born actually last night. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> and oh, congratulations. It, it, thank you. And it gets to be an issue in the winter time parking on the street and, um, and then during snow emergencies having to park in say the town lot or, uh, another location and then bustling kids back and forth um, and, and so forth. Uh, so I spoke to Jeff Saka, uh, who was on this call at 7.30, um, but had to go because of his kids um, <laughs> to, to come out and look at the, the property and see if we could get parking. Um, he put together uh, a proposal where the 1618 Swan Place is a side-by-side -side duplex um, built in 1820. Um, there are three uh, identical houses all in a row on Swan Place. Um, and we're the middle house in that. Both the other houses have parking. Um, we're the only ones without parking. You can't get down um, the side of the house to put parking in the back because our front doors to each unit, and this is all shown on the pictures that, that we submitted, um, the front doors to each unit are on the side of the house. There's no access to the house from the front. Um, so uh, Jeff Saka proposed putting uh, single car parking uh, in in front of each door. Um, so if you if you go to the pictures there, so that picture's fine there. Uh, if you look on the side, that's the door um, in the back there. Yep, right there. And then there's a front um, kind of walkway in the front on, on our side. And then there's a porch on the other side, which we're planning to peel back. Um, 
so we'll we'll need to leave the door on the side and um and then we can get a car a car on each side um and not have a car parked on the uh, on the uh sidewalk um and th and th that's the proposal he put together um and i i was th that's a picture showing i guess we need vegetation so th there's the front walkway that's my side on 16 um so we're going to take up this this cement uh area and put uh so you could fit a car there um and that would require uh two curb cuts the curb cut for 16 side and a curb cut for 18 side um that's my neighbors who have parking um and then uh and, oh, and that shows uh vegetation i guess the vegetation was needed um to document um and then I, I, I guess. Uh, oh, uh, Jeff also spoke to. Um, that's that's 18 side. We're gonna move that um, that wood area back uh, to fit the car in. Um, Jeff also sp spoke to engineering. He explained the the plans to engineering, and they agreed and said that they had no problem with it. I've also spoke to Rick Ballarelli. Um, who advised me to submit the uh, forms for the uh, variance and special permit to have um, a drive, uh, two separate driveways, one for each um, each side of the duplex, and uh, for parking in the front, uh, due to the fact that we can't get around um, the front doors to each unit, which are on the side. And I, I guess I can open it up for questions. Oh, uh, we also had, I've spoke to, uh, I've lived in this neighborhood um, since 1994. Um, my father, um, I grew up right across the street here at 7 Swan Street. I know all the neighbors. I spoke to all of them. Um, a number of them said that they were planning on coming tonight. I know that, that some of them did. Um, but they, they weren't able to stay until nine um, due to their schedules. But everybody has been in support of this um, and I, I've heard no objections. Thank you. Um, did you receive a copy of um, a memorandum prepared by the Department of Planning and Community Development in regards to this? Um, I don't believe so. Okay. because they have um, some questions in regards to this application. Um, go ahead and switch documents here. <coughs> um, so they specifically had some concerns about the depth of the parking spaces that could be achieved. Um, and we're noting that um, so I think I think this is all stuff that um, that Jeff Saka had spoke to um, that with the with the parking on the side, we mm -hmm. would have plenty of depth that we would not block um, the sidewalk in any way. Okay. So on the building itself, oops, let's actually get the image. Oh, no, it's not your house. Um, do you know what the distance is from like the edge of the port, the edge of the top step here to the sidewalk? Is that greater than 20 feet, do you know? The edge of the top set of the stairs? Yeah. 
to, to get into my house, I believe it is greater than 20 feet. Okay. I, I can check right now if <laughs> it's right <laughs> out front. I was gonna say, because um, there's, there's those conditions, there's that, I think that's one of their larger um, concerns, but then there's the board also needs to consider the, the criteria for a variance. Um, and the criteria for the variance are, are set by state law. They're not set by local ordinance. And yes, so I think that's that. That's something that that Jeff Saka, um, who mm -hmm. is bonded by the town, has looked into and created the plan for that. With that in mind. Okay. So has he submitted any additional plans other than what we what no. we see? Here? Um, no, he he. Uh, he had, as I said, he spoke to engineering uh, yeah. in person. He does a lot of work for the town, and um, and they said that that they didn't have a problem with it. Um, and then he advised me to fill out the the paperwork that I submitted uh, to you. Okay. Well, open us up for questions from the board. Other questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess I'll start. I, I don't think this at all. Um, uh, how can we tell the distance from the structure, especially the stairway out to the sidewalk from what we have? Oh, uh, we certainly, yeah, you know, we have this one indication here that the, you know, before we get to the, the house, there's a space that's nine by 18, um, but we certainly don't have anything that, you know, the, oh, so the seal here doesn't apply to these notes. The seal applies to the plan in general. So we don't have, you know, a true site plan that demonstrates. So, that we so have okay, so if that, if that is eight, 18 feet, as we have documented here, then, that shows, if you go to the picture of my house with that cement pad, um, yep. that's, that's well over two feet. That cement pad starts at the front of my house. Mm -hmm. so, so it's clear that that's, that's over two feet. Yeah, so it's tough to know from the, the plan doesn't indicate the location of the sidewalk. Um, it's tough to know if the sidewalk is on this. You know, if this if this is the line of the actual street, then the sidewalk is inside of that, and Mr. so we Chairman, don't know. We're uh, still looking at the, the planning memo. Could you put up the um, what you're looking at, please? Sorry. Thank you for that. <laughs> so. So on this plan here, yeah. So the the line of the street, um, it's we can't tell from this plan if this is the actual line of the curb, or you know, and where the sidewalk is relative to that, and the size of the sidewalk, um, which I think, as Mr. O'Rourke is getting at, is sort of very critical information for understanding exactly where. Uh, the sidewalk would need to be constructed, uh, excuse me, where the driveway would need to be constructed in order to avoid interfering with the sidewalk. Right, right. I completely understand. Uh, it was my understanding that uh, that, that that plan is my, uh, my property. Um, mm -hmm. I, it, didn't, it didn't occur to me that that would include um, a sidewalk on the, the site plan for my property. Yeah. It, uh, I mean, it, it, and it, Honestly, around town, it varies. And sometimes the sidewalk is on the property and sometimes it's not. So it's- um, we're, we're in the center of town. To have the, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So one of, the, one of the key questions the board is gonna to need to consider um, if the board is allowing so the, the town does not allow parking in the front yard setback. 
So in order to allow parking in the front yard setback, the board would need to grant a variance to allow it. And the var variances have you know, four very structured criteria that the board needs to address. And so the, one of the first questions the board really is gonna need to consider um, as we're discussing how we would wanna proceed is does the does this property does this uh, does the property meet the criteria for a special permit? Um, variance and and for a variance, Mr. Chairman. For a variance, because short of a, if, in order to grant par parking, the board is going to need to grant a variance. If the board wishes to grant uh, a parking space on either side, that that then is a special permit because it also would require um, a second driveway. But if the board can't find that the property meets the criteria for a variance, then we're sort of stuck at stage one. Um, but then before we before we discuss that, unless there's anyone else in the board who wishes to go forward, I would like to um, open this up from the public. Um, I know we, we have at least one person with their hand up, but I think that if there are members of the public who are members of this um, of this neighborhood, it would be uh, very good to hear from them. Okay, so with that, I will go ahead and open up uh, the, the hearing for public comment. Um, as I said before, members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button, which is now on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. Um, and those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You'll be called upon by the host and asked to give your name and address for the record. And you'll be given time for your questions and comments. Um, so that the first speaker we have is Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, I am not uh, in the neighborhood. If, you, if there's anyone else that wants to speak that's a neighbor, they should probably speak before me. Uh, it ends up though, so. You are currently the only one with a hand up. Okay. Um, just, a, just a quick question. Um, there certainly are a number of properties in town, a uh, significant number of properties in town that don't have parking on their sites. Uh, and those are the folks, of course, that park in the, the town lots and such during snow emergencies. Um, what is the board's general position on adding parking to uh, uh, structures and units like this, in this case, a two family, or, or perhaps even a single family that doesn't have parking, about adding parking when none exists. Um, the properties of, that are under that condition certainly have changed hands a number of times when purchased without parking uh, um, and sold without parking. Does the board have a general position on adding parking? Um, I don't believe we have a a general policy in regards to parking. I know that the, as a part of the zoning bylaw, um, one of the one of the intentions of the zoning bylaw is that parcels that are currently non are that are currently non compliant are brought into greater compliance over time. Um, and so currently, this property is non compliant in that it does not provide parking. Um, and by the zoning bylaw, it would be Required as a two-family property to have two parking spaces, and so it certainly was within the. Um, I think sort of the, the intent. If you read the intent of the bylaw, where it says that we should be seeking greater conformity uh, with the bylaw, then we should be considering adding the adding the parking spaces. I know, and um, there are other discussions in town in regards to you know net zero policy and other such such matters that are trying to reduce the amount of, of vehicular use and traffic and certainly um, arguments have been made at town meeting in regards to you know, whether there should be you know how much parking is really required um, but I, I think in you know in this particular instance there are there are reasons expressed by the applicant that you know certainly makes sense for his circumstance and for um, circumstances of property like his in general, but I don't think the, the board doesn't have a very specific policy um, in mind in regards to whether parking should be added where none exists. 
Okay, thank you. That 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 helps me uh, understand uh, a little better. But so generally, the board's guidance in these sorts of cases is to try and bring a property into greater than a non-conforming property into greater compliance with the zoning laws. Correct. That's generally your your approach. So I mean, that's 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 a an, an intent of the zoning bylaw, and so in as much as that that's what the bylaws is, requ is requesting the board does the, the board tries to follow that as best it can okay uh so this is a a two-family home correct in which i assume the applicant lives in one half of it that's correct yes uh and is the current zoning is the current compliance with zoning bylaw two spaces per unit so there'd be four spaces required on the lot so current zoning is one space per unit one space per unit okay Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. You're very welcome. And um, Mr. Potter, just to make sure I understand this properly, the the there is no front doors to the property. That's correct. Yes. There's no front doors to the property. The the access to each unit is on the side of the building. Yeah, so that's our front door right there that you have your your mouse on. That's okay. that's 18's front door. And there's but there's not a front door out yes. here in this area. That's correct. There is no front door in the in the front of the building. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, next on our speakers list is Mr. Kendallor. Yes. Hi. And if you give your name and address for the record and tell us what you like sure uh paul candelori it's 58 lombard terrace we're actually directly behind um ben and uh from the the plans here um initially i was watching to see if there was any talk about constructing a garage or something in the back um, but <laughs> apparently that's not the case um but i first of all i'd like to say i'm completely for this um i have no objections and um we also it our um, residents have no driveway. So again, I encourage any time uh, that someone can get the driveway and we do the same thing. We, you know, in the winter time, we're parking in the lot and, you know, schlepping back home in a snowstorm um, because of the, the lack of a driveway. Um, I also just wanted to point out, you were saying that, um, you know, if you found a reason um, for him to put the parking up front, it seems just seems to me that having his front his entrances where they are completely eliminates the the possibility of him going beyond that, and that hopefully that that will help. Um, that that is your reason for saying they have to put the driveways up front um, because there really is no way to get past. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I also understand the certain distance from the sidewalk, and that's not clear. Um, so there could be, you know, stumbling blocks. But again, just wanted to give my my voice to encourage, um, you know, when people apply for adding driveways to, um, uh, you know, properties that don't have them, that it's definitely a good thing. Um, I I find it, you know, it's odd because there's a no parking, there's a no overnight law yet there are all these properties in town that don't provide parking. So it's a, it's a bit of a conundrum. Indeed. Anything further, sir? But again, no, that's it. Just again, no objections. So uh, I hope things proceed well for you, Ben. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate you coming. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Are there any further members of the public to speak on this matter? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public comment for this evening. Um, <clears throat> so I think the, the, the first question before the board is, do we have sufficient information to proceed um, 
with findings of fact in regards to the possible applicability of the of the variance criteria. I don't, Mr. Chairman, Mr. O'Rourke. Um, don't we need a certified plot plan with these measurements or some sort of, you know, other than the, the mortgage inspection plan with, with numbers on it of particular distance from the sidewalk up through where the end of the driveway is going to be? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think maybe we should have a discussion about the criteria just so we don't go do that and then die on the criteria. But I think we would need that. But I welcome your thoughts. Yeah, because certainly I, I think where everything sort of hinges on whether or not the site qualifies for a variance, um, I think that's really sort of the, the first question. And you know, the first criteria is whether there's anything related to soil conditions, shape, or topography of the lot that um, creates a hard, essentially creates a hardship that can but that is unique to this property. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I really would like to focus on that and I'm not sure, and I think it might be dispositive, but I certainly, this is another case like the Webster Street case where I'd really like to, to be able to uh, do something uh, to serve the objective. Um, but I'm, we, we know that there's nothing about the soil conditions that matter here. We haven't heard a word about soil conditions. And the topography is quite flat. So there's no special requirements as far as topography. So that pretty much puts you to shape. And when you look at it, this doesn't seem like an unusually shaped lot. Uh, what's wrong, the fundamental problem here is has nothing to do with the shape of the lot. It has to do with the placement and design of the building that given where they are, they can't get to where they need to be without, without a whole lot of reconstruction. Um, and you know that if we were to interpret this uh, precisely because it's an attractive to try to find a way uh, to, uh, to treat the, the shape of the lot criterion in a relatively loose way, we are likely to have that quoted back at us any number of times because this kind of problem comes up in almost every every uh, uh, every variance case. And so even apart from the fact that state law it takes a strict view, it seems to me that we need to be careful um, to be to approach this in a in a in a consistent way. And I guess if there's if there's an argument for why this meets the the uh, shape criterion, um, I don't understand. I, I don't understand what it is. Uh, I do understand why there's a hardship because of the way in which the building is situated on the lot and much else that is just sort of the way things are. Uh, but the state didn't see fit to make that the inquiry that we are supposed to do. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Could you pull up that first criteria so the applicant can see what we're talking about? Absolutely. Zoning bylaw variances. Oops. Do we not have the variance criteria in our zoning bylaw? Would it be on this application? Um. The request for special permit. Oh, that's right. Oh, and there, but now yeah, special permit. 
Dimensional form. I don't think he included it. I can bring up the yeah, memorandum. It's just on the special permit. Um, so the document that we have from um, so this is the memo from the Department of Planning and Community Development. <coughs> um, and so here they in an abbreviated fashion, they do um, the first set of criteria as a criteria for special permit. But this is their reading of the interpretation of the variance criteria. Um, but they don't provide much detail. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, if uh, we might want to step, if we want to make It'll take me a couple of minutes, but I can easily shoot you a copy of the provision in state law if I can just, I've been trying to work through my hard drive while we've been talking and have been having a hard time coming up with it, but I will do it. I can certainly do it relatively quickly. I do have the, here, I, mean, actually, I just found a, pulled up a variance, a blank variance application. So let me go grab that. The variance applications actually also have to to uh, paraphrase paraphrase state law, um, but I I can if you want if it's I don't I have no idea how you could enable me to screen share what I'm looking at now, um, but I could I could shoot it to you. Well, I think this is fine, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted the applicant to see what what we were talking about um, in that. In order for him to do this, it's not a special permit, it's a variance, correct? Yes, right. So the first criteria, and all four criteria have to be met, and the first one is sort of the, the circumstances related to the soil conditions, shape, or topography, which especially affect the land or structure in question, which do not generally affect the zoning district in which the land or structure is located. Um, and so I think the, the question is, as Mr. Hanlon, I think was phrasing it is, you know, that there isn't anything in particular about the soil conditions or the topography that lead to an issue. Um, and so it really sort of comes, is there something about the shape of the property and how is, which especially, it's especially, excuse me, affects the land or structure in question, which doesn't generally affect the zoning district in which the land or structure is located. I think the the question then is, is the, is the plate, so the building predates zoning um, in town. And so is there something about the, the way that the building is sited on the lot, which now, this, now that zoning has been overlaid, creates a condition whereby that it, you know, is not general to the district. I mean, certainly there are other properties um, on this street that have sufficient side yard to get to the back because of the way the, the houses, either the houses were established after the, the, the zoning act was enacted or um, just happened to provide enough access be, around the house. Um, whereas this structure here does not. Um, certainly one question to consider is the, the building next door um, so the, the building adjacent to it closer to Massachusetts Avenue does have two driveways and a parking space across the entire front yard. Um, now I don't know, and I don't know if, if Mr. Valarelli has any idea if those were constructed with permits, um, but certainly there are other buildings in this neighborhood where this approach has been taken. Uh, and I don't know if that is something that sh should enter into the board's decision or not. Mr. Valarelli, do you have any idea in regards to this, how the parking that might be on adjacent properties may have been constructed? I don't, Mr. Chairman. So there's no building permit required for uh, installing a parking space or a driveway. You just, there's, there's rules and regulations. And, and if there is a curb cut that's dealt with a permit through engineering, but as far as an actual building permit being required to construct a driveway, 
No, that doesn't exist. Um, my guess would be those driveways were there for a while, or the or the uh, or the owners just put them in, unaware of the um, restrictions, and um, were never reported. Or there's a lot of circumstances all over town. So in regards to this first criteria, I think that what Mr. Mr. Hamlin was saying before is that certainly we, you know, in an, in an attempt to try and validate and, and sort of substantiate what the applicant is requesting, we could do we, we don't want to get ourselves into a position where we agree to something that then come, becomes, you know, canon for future cases before the board. Um, so I think my, I guess the, the question I would have to ask of other members of the board is, you know, where do we really stand on this question? Um, and if we're uncertain, will getting additional information about the site lead us to being able to to make a better decision or do we just or in general do we just find that the property does not meet the first criteria um mr chairman the, yes sir can i one of the things that we might want to think of that i have not adequately thought through um the, as you can see in the variance criteria here, it's circumstances relating to the soil condition, shape, or topography, which especially affect the land or structures in question. And clearly the soil conditions don't affect the structures, or at least they're not of the structures. Maybe they are, maybe I can see where that goes. And topography is not a structure sort of thing either. And I'm wondering, whether there is any authority for the proposition that even that even though the sh the plot the lot is of a perfectly ordinary shape or it doesn't pose any particular problems that this is the variance criteria are broader and that somehow the shape of the of the structure might might do so um, i feel nervous about the whole thought of that but it's a legal question and it's state law. So it is something that, um, that we may want to have advice on. Absolutely. So if we, if the board wanted to seek additional guidance from council, we could do so. Um, and we would need to continue at this point. Um, are there any other points that we would want to get input from council in this regards? Hearing none. Um, whereas, you know, the the whether, whereas criteria number one really is the crux of everything at the point at this point. Um, I agree with Mr. Hanna. It would be helpful to get input from council as to whether we can grant um, the circumstance for criteria number one that would allow us to proceed. Um, I know that the, the memo from planning um, sort of notes that uh, the side yards are of insufficient size to provide off-street parking for residents of the structure, and there's no ability to provide off-street parking anywhere on the property except within the front yard setback. Um, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that the that this criteria is met. Um, so if it's acceptable to the applicant, it's acceptable to the board. I think I would request, I would um, recommend that we continue and uh, receive written guidance from council in regards to that point. Okay. And Mr. Chairman? Mr. Rourke? I think we also need um, to, you know, clearer measurements on a plan uh, before we're going to look at this again. Is, do you agree? I would certainly, yes. <clears throat> and then I was wondering if you could pull up the, the applicant's application and could we look at with the parking, where the, the driveways would go up to the porches again. Um, I just want to just be clear before they come back. With some pictures with his application. Oh, the pictures, sorry. Yeah. That's the one side. Yeah, right here, for example. It is, is it, so the, the proposed, if you do the split driveways, it would go all the way to, would it go right to, yeah. right to where the cement walkway is there leading to the porch, or would that come out? Well, I okay. think that's. Part of what we would need to have detailed, um, because it may also be that in order to get sufficient depth, um, that the the stairs that are currently facing the front of the house, um, they may need to either face the rear or face the side in order to, you know, accommodate space. And that's something the applicant would have to consider as to whether, you know, making that adjustment. You know, is worthwhile and in, in, in making the you know a, a valid parking space. So I, I I don't think that that uh, that that we would have to do anything with the stairs. The the way Saka had had it um, proposed is he would just take up that that cement walkway and then there would be it would it would go right up to the stairs. But but you can fit. A single car comfortably, um, you, you know, we're not going to have a car butted right up to uh, to the stairs. Um, but that's how he had it planned out. Mm -hmm. I guess, Mr. Chairman, we need a plan to that effect that said it, it, it fit a legal size parking space, which is what eight and a half by eighteen. Um, yeah, I think it's yeah. It's, yeah. Okay, that's something I can get. Okay. Yeah, so I think you'd, yeah, so you'd need to have a, a site, a, a real site survey um, that would include, that could then really demonstrate, you know, precisely where the property line is, where the building is in relation to the property line, the location of the sidewalk, and then what space would be used for parking. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, um, I just is there anything else if 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 for some reason we we got encouraging um, advice from council as to getting through the first criteria and we got into hardship and, and everything else, one of the questions would have to do with uh, uh, the pedestrian impact and the things that that the memo says. And if we all got by that, we'd have to approve a special permit and the special permit will hold the applicant to plans and conditions that were submitted in, in connection with that. And we're talking about three or four weeks delay here. And I just wonder whether there is anything else that we haven't talked about that we would need in order for there to be the final plans that that the applicant would be held to if uh, he got all the way through the gauntlet and won. Because I don't want to find ourselves in a position where 
we've waited for three or four weeks and we've gotten some of what we want, but then we're faced with not having everything. And this would be the time to make sure that the applicant has all the information that's necessary for us ultimately make, to, make, to uh, make a decision on the special permit too. I certainly reviewing the criteria for a special permit. Um, I think the questions are, you know, its impact on public convenience and welfare. Um, it's a question we would need to address. Um, I don't, the impairment of public safety, as you mentioned, is the question of the sidewalk um, and that the the planning department had said that you know, obviously parking a car on the sidewalk creates a, a distinct hazard for pedestrians who are now going to have to go in the, who would have to go in the street. So I think it's very important that we make sure that any parking that we accommodate does not in any way hinder the, the free transit on the sidewalk. Um, there would not be an undue burden on municipal systems. Um, the special regulation is the regulation on the request for a special uh, for a second driveway. Um, and then it comes down to integrity or character of the district. And I think that the, you know, if you look up and down the street, there are a number of, because these, you know, these are older houses built in the center of the town. I think a lot of these houses are probably predating the zoning ordinance and therefore um, they really have problems with parking. Some do have the ability to get around them and go to the back, but you know, as the you know, a budding neighbor to the left shows, there are certainly other properties on the street that utilize a portion of the front yard for parking. And I think one can make an argument that you know, having these kinds of small parking spaces um, fit within the character of the district. And I think the, you know, the board could come up with appropriate um, conditions that would uh, make the appearance of those spaces um, more in keeping with you know, with the, sort of the you know res, front yard residential character, and it certainly would not create a detrimental excess of a particular use. So I, I think as you're saying, if we can get if if the board is able to get to to make findings that satisfy the requirements of the variance criteria, I think the board can, through conditions, come up with an applicable come up with um, with with findings, with conditions that would um, meet the meet the requirements of the the seven criteria for a special permit. I agree, Mr. Chair. It's, just, it's that first variance condition, as Mr. Hammond pointed out, that's going to be the issue. So I think with that, then we have two tasks. One, the board needs to get a written um, uh, guidance from the from town council in regards to um, the applicability of using the the location of the building on a on a site predating the zoning bylaw. Whether that um, would be a circumstance that would be acceptable to meet criteria number one of, of the variance criteria as established under state law. And then the, the second would be to um, ask the applicant to come back with a, a more detailed site plan that um, addresses the, the concerns we had expressed before, specifically uh, the dimension of the area that would be available for parking um, and really locating the property lines, the location of the house, and especially the location of that sidewalk so that we're all very clear about where those things are. I think it's also, if I'm remembering correctly, um, thought there was a manhole there there is a manhole um and the way that uh that saka had um proposed it he was going around it and uh and again he spoke to engineering and they agreed okay so that, that was not an impact And is there anything 
further on this from the board? None, I would, then I will move to continue. Um, the variance and special permit hearing for 1618 Swan Place um, until it's Tuesday, December 21st at 7.30 p.m. Can I have a second on that? Second. Thank you. Um, vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Work. Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on that item, uh, which brings us and I, I uh, thank Mr. Potter and um, thank Mr. Candelori for, for sticking around um, and presenting to us this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then we need to flag uh, Mr. DuPont that he is, that we are back. I'm here, Mr. Chairman. Oh, there you are. Perfect. Okay, so next on the agenda uh, is docket number 367-725 Highland Avenue. Um, up here on behalf of the applicant is Ms. Van. If you could go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what uh, you were planning to do. Sure, uh, good evening. My name is Olga Ramiro Van and I am um, the owner of 25 Highland Avenue. Thank you everybody for a long meeting so far and for our patience with everybody. That's, um, so uh, what we are asking, we're doing, this is a two family um, property that we are renovating. And um, this property currently has no parking spaces. So we're asking to um, have this two parking spots uh, locate them in the front yard. There are some challenges um, with the little bit of topography of the lot. Uh, it is on the hill. So uh, we will have to remove um, some soil and have we'll have to construct a retaining wall to um, have comfortable 20 feet wide and 18 feet deep parking space for two cars and some trash cans uh, for the people that will be living at 25 Highland Avenue as we will finish the construction. Um, we did run into the challenge of uh, having a tree on the um, sidewalk in front of the house. Um, and I did speak with the team from the tree ward and I was told that um, there is no way around it. We have to uh, stay four feet away from the tree. And that's why we updated the, the, the plot plan that we have in hand. Uh, plot plan was professionally done um, right before we started the renovation. And uh, we still have room to move the proposed parking space uh, to the left from initial proposition and stay away from the tree. So that way we're not harming the tree and should be comfortably uh, going in and out from the driveway. So um, yeah, this is this is the ask. I mean, the purpose of the bylaws is to promote the health, safety and convenience for all the inhabitants of the town of Arlington and having a parking space in front of this property first and foremost will be safety for uh, the future owners who will be residing in the property, uh, kids, elderly. Um, and uh, second of all, um, that will also remove the cars from the street, allowing easy snow removal and street cleaning. So that's what I have. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share the application package. So this is the, um, the original package, this is the original location of the proposed location for the parking. And there's a tree in this location. All right. So a tree is about nine feet from the lot line. 
And so this is the proposed revision. So this yeah. is the- Yep, yep. So the tree is five feet from the lot line and we have to stay around, away from it four feet. I was told by the tree ward. Um, <clears throat> and so for those of you who aren't familiar with Highland Avenue, so this is <clears throat> the first of, I believe it's four, three or four houses in a row that have a, a substantial retaining wall um, at the sidewalk and it pitches up from there to the house. So the house is very high above the street. So perhaps, uh, yes. So I'd like to add right away, I mean, listening to the previous um, applicant as well, I do understand that um, since we proposing the parking lot and that will take a removal of the soil in front, I will have to provide a um, plan of a retaining wall. And I already made no a note of that. Okay. Have you done any research into whether there are any easements in the front yard of the property? I did speak with the land surveyor that um, has done uh, the plot plan for us and there is no easement in okay. um, um, there is no record of any easement um, actually we were in a conversation with the zoning and um, I, I I made a note if there is anything that is not with a um, registry of deeds that I should know about um, just not there land surveyor I had a conversation with him and he said there was no easements at this point okay Are there questions from the board? I don't see any at the moment. <clears throat> so this is a request for a variance um, mm -hmm. to allow the construction in the front yard. So it would be a to the criteria that we're going to be evaluating are the criteria for for variance. Okay. The board is aware. Um, unless there's a question specifically from the board, I will go ahead with public comments. Seeing none. Um, so go ahead and open the hearing for public comment um, as before. Uh, if you'd like to speak, if you could select the raise hand from um, what is now the reactions tab, or if you're calling in, if you could dial star nine. Uh, so first is uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street, and a, a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. Um, I, when I first was looking at the, uh, the uh, application, I, I was surprised to find the street tree there right where they wanted to put the driveway. I'm pleased to hear that they consulted with the tree warden it sounds like the tree warden has given specific guidance relative to protection of this tree. Um, I do have um, a couple of questions though. Uh, how long has the applicant owned this property, if I may ask? So we purchased, oh, no. uh, so the, the, we purchased the property in, uh, oh, I have to uh, look it up. I think that was July for this one. Okay, so, uh, and it was purchased with the understanding that there was no parking on site available, correct? No, no. No, no, it was purchased with your knowledge that there was right. no parking related to this. Yeah. Yes, so um, this is, um, uh, we purchased this property to renovate with intention of renovation. Um, this is uh, not the first project in Arlington. Um, we did know that there's no parking in front of the property. However, at this point, as we proceed, uh, you know, working on the project, um, I do know and I believe that having park in front that will benefit the um, the owners. Just like previous applicant, people have kids, people have elderly, and having cars on the streets in a snowstorm it just 
besides being inconvenient, it's a safety. And um, I, I would love to have the opportunity to to have that parking there, if right. I could. Uh, thank you. Um, I, it looks like you've already proceeded significantly down the road of renovation. Uh, the siding is entirely off the house. All the windows are out. No one lives there, I'm, I'm sure. Was mm -hmm. the plan submitted for this property? Yes. So the tree warden has that plan? To tree warden, no. We submitted renovation plan to the building department. No, I'm, I mean the tree plan that goes as part of the application. Since this is a substantial renovation, you need to submit a tree plan. Well, I apologize. This is what not to my knowledge, and I will make sure I'll submit that to the tree ward. Yeah, the tree plan would have the street tree on it, plus any additional trees. It looks from what I can tell from the satellite photography, there's trees substantial trees around the property. I don't know if it's on your property or on your neighbor's property, particularly in the back. Um, all the trees that are in the setbacks are protected trees by the bylaw since you're doing substantial renovation. Um, so they need to have all have protection before renovation begins. You now, however, have commenced with renovations. It sounds, looks to me, prior to submitting the plan or doing any of the tree protections. Is that correct? So we do have trees around the property, um, specifically larger trees on the left and a few in the back closer to lot line. On the right side from satellite, those are um, actually, those are not, if you look, uh, if you see- Yeah, those are in your neighbor's back. property, I assume. Right, right. There's some on the neighbor's property and close by, we have just some shrubs. It's not, those are not the trees. Okay, right now the, the, the way that, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I'm jumping. Mm -hmm. uh, right now the protected trees by protect by the bylaw are eight inches in diameter or larger. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of the trees that you're talking about that are on the back sections of the property that are within the setbacks, but greater than eight inches, I don't know if they are, but if they are, they require protection measures uh, and, and ma maintaining of the trees, not cutting them down. Um, as per the bylaw requirements. The tree warden is familiar with all of that. If you have spoken with him before, you probably want to get in touch with him again and provide him with a tree plan that he must approve before renovation begins. <laughs> so I think you need to do that pretty quick. Uh, this is what I will, I'll make sure I'll take care of this week, um, latest Monday. Great. That, that, that's that's very good news. Thank, thank you. Uh, one additional thing is when you do do construction on the front of that street tree, if you protect it, the type of construction you're discussing here is significant. Right. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for you not to damage this street tree, which is protected under Chapter 87 bylaw. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chapter 87 general laws. So you're going to have to put significant protection on that street tree. Again, the tree warden Tim Laquive can help you with that. Yeah, yeah, uh, I do appreciate the input. Um, it, it is a challenging property to work on, and we were uh, by you know working on the demo and getting the materials to the side. We're using um, we can't put a dumpster, none of that. So we're working only with the smaller trucks um, that minimizes the volume, and it's um, it's a I would say tedious process. However, we're working uh, slowly on that. Um, and I will make sure I'll work with the, um, I'll walk with another owner of our company um, through the lot tomorrow and um, uh, I'll mark all the trees and I'll speak with Tim on that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Okay, thank you for your input. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Valerelli, what's the current status of the permitting on this project? Does it have a construction permit or just a demolition permit or what's the status? They do, Mr. Chairman. Um, they have a uh, permit to renovate the first and second floor. Okay. Uh, demolition, of course, and uh, depending on the outcome of their request for the driveway, they may go forward with additional work. Okay, thank you. Um, the next speaker uh, is uh, Anson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anson Stewart, 12 Moulton Road, which abuts 25 Highland to the northwest. Uh, this is a substantial project, project and a large addition of gross floor area, which 
I'm happy about and I'm looking forward to having some additional neighbors soon. Uh, I would, however, like to raise a few issues for the board to consider regarding criterion three, specifically the second bullet point under criterion three in the planning department memo. That suggests um, there's insufficient detail in the retaining wall. I understand the board now has some additional details on the retaining wall, but I think there are some additional factors to consider specifically with respect to safety and visibility for drivers who would be exiting the proposed parking area. So cars travel very fast on Highland. A couple months ago, there was a two car crash that actually impacted the house three doors down at 15 Molten. If you go by 15 Molten today, you'll see that the front deck is being totally rebuilt because two cars collided and crashed into it. And so I think visibility here is very important for cars that would be coming out of a driveway. We certainly wouldn't want that driveway to be hidden by a tree or by a tall retaining wall. Uh, the planning department memo did note that uh, just up the street at 39 Highland, there is a similar parking area built into the hillside. I think it's important to note that that retaining wall is about half the height of what the proposed one would be. And it's on a much more gradual slope, so it has significantly better visibility. Um, as proposed, there would be a lot of dirt being moved here. And I think it's important for the board to also consider zoning bylaw 5.3.12b, uh, which would require no more than two and a half feet of retaining wall, as I understand it, going five feet back into the property. So that would involve moving even more dirt. Um, that's a lot of dirt to be moving. So uh, I have a few concerns about that and some of the preliminary regrading that's already happened around the back of the site. Uh, if the board does approve this variance, I would want to know if there are conditions that could be added to make sure that that uh, dirt is moved off site or that if it's kept on site, there's uh, work done to make sure that drainage and other considerations are, are addressed. Um, lastly, on, on, this, on the topic of the parking itself, I'll note that the one house to the left or two houses to the left and one house to the right. So three other houses in this set of four all use on-street parking. So there will be cars upstream and downstream of this. Um, so I'm not sure if there's benefit provided for plowing or street sweeping operations because there will still be cars parked there. Uh, so those are my concerns about the parking itself. Um, one last note on the rear yard setback. There, the application says that that's going from 17.8 feet to nine feet. As I understand, the minimum is 20. And as Mr. Moore noted, uh, there is a large mature tree on the property here. Uh, and I'm not sure what the applicant would say about kind of the, the porch space with respect to the proposed uh, new space going back into that setback, increasing the nonconformity and uh, being near that tree. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so the application before us is only in regards to uh, the front yard parking. It does not relate um, to construction on the site. Um, I would just ask Mr. Valarelli, um, I'm just going to quickly bring up a plan here. So this is the, <coughs> the site plan. I think the, what the recent yeah. uh, speaker was questioning is the construction of um, this porch, this two floor porch structure here. I believe, is, is it a two story structure here on the rear of the house? Uh, this is the decks we're proposing. Uh, we have not received a permit on that yet. It is proposed. And uh, Mr. Valarelli has requested from me details on the decks. So the architect is working on it. Um, that's something we're proposing. And uh, if that will be approved, we'd like to have those decks for the for the units in the back. Uh, but that would be probably um, conversation for another meeting. Okay. So 
just again, so what exactly has been approved for scope of work so far? Ms. Valerelli, is it just interior work on the first and second floor and that's it? Correct, Mr. Chairman. They are uh, digging out the basement slab to repour that. Right now, they have a permit for the renovation of the first and second floor only. Okay. And the basement slab. Okay, so these window wells on the on the uphill side, the rear deck, and um, these uh, patios and landings on the downhill side, those have not been approved? Again, Mr. Chairman, correct. Uh, we're still, we, we, ha we have not gotten to that point. Um, I cannot speak for the applicant, but it's my understanding that if the board grants the driveway, um, the proposed front yard parking, they may go in a different direction with the renovation. Um, if they don't grant it, they may go in a, in yet again, another direction. Okay. Right now, is the, is the uh, driveway. Okay, and, and Mr. Valerelli, I know we've touched on this in, in recent cases, but um, sight lines from driveways. What is the, the, I believe the requirement is that you can have nothing higher than three feet within five feet of the sidewalk, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's called, uh, it's traffic visibility. So um, the uh, first five feet, in from the property line cannot be any more than 30 inches. Okay. So this, we would need to be granting a variance from that requirement as well. Because mm -hmm. that was not listed as a variance that is being requested. To just a variance from the requirement for front yard parking. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Pat, I just wondered, um, is the is the, the ruling I take it are the rule that relates to the size to the uh, size of the retaining wall in the first five feet is a zoning ordinance rule, correct? Mr. No, Valerelli. Really? It is, Mr. Chairman. It's actually 5.3.12 traffic visibility. It is actually, I think we're looking at B, 5.3.12B. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going back to the uh, speakers list. Um, next is Laurie Ann Medeiros. Hi, I am actually at 21 Highland Ave, um, which is directly abutting the property. Um, so the retaining wall would be that they're going to put in for this driveway would be retaining my land as well. Um, so I have a little concern about, I mean, these, the, these, this whole wall is like 92 years old. Um, we've all, we all have the same permit parking for the street. Um, so it's not like there's no parking on this street. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of concerned of cutting into this property affecting my property and also for the safety on the street because I'm still gonna have cars parked in front of my house. Um, so the cars coming out of this driveway are gonna be coming into traffic past cars are already parked looking up and down the street. Um, plus, I mean, it's just kind of one of those, it's, it's a, a, a big concern for me as far as safety. We have four track teams that run up and down the street during his spring and, and fall track um, from Arlington Catholic and Arlington High School. We have kids that walk to school. Th this stretch of, of road is probably the only one without driveways for a long period of time because of this wall. Um, so a lot of people have come to be, you know, used to just kind of going down the street and everything with no driveway impeding and, and not having cars kind of set back in with a wall that high. So that that's my concern for, you know, the street. As I say, I've lived here for 23 years. Um, we've always parked on the street. We probably have to move our car five times in the winter for snowstorms. Um, so I don't really know if it's that big of a concern for whoever lives next door. Um, it's not, 
you know, an unbelievable thing to have to move your car five times in the winter. Um, but I, I, I guess that's all really I have to say. I mean, that, that house that was hit, um, that Mr. Stewart had brought up has actually been hit twice. So there have been four houses hit on Highland Ave um, over since I've lived on the street. One was hit twice. Um, we've had cars that have been totaled at the intersection of Wildwood and Highland Ave. As, as Mr. Stewart said, the cars that go up and down the street go quite fast. It, there's only four main streets that go between Mass Ave and Route 2. And it, Highland Ave is one along with Lake Street, Highland Ave, Park Ave, um, in Pleasant Street. So I, I think it's just one of those things that this is more of a main street than a side street um, for transportation purposes. Uh, just, to, just to clarify something you, you had said before. So I believe these houses have a special, can apply for an on-street parking permit to allow them to park there, even though the town has a prohibition on overnight parking. Is that correct? So each for each unit, you get one parking spot. So they wouldn't be losing a spot um, on the street. They would still, you know, what I mean, so you get two to get a spot each for each unit. So they're just moving the spots into the into their um, property. Okay. And as you said, when it when there's a snowstorm or when there's a snow emergency declared, where do you have to move your car to? Um, to this uh, to the center parking lot. Um, we also have neighbors that like if you know when my daughter was young as i say i've lived here for 23 years she's now 21 i would ask a neighbor if she was you know really little if i could just park the car overnight during a, a snow emergency no one's ever had a problem with that um but as i say we have we, we are able to park at the at the um right behind um uh right in the center there by um, russell commons Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, next on our list uh, is Jana Strominger. Yes, Jana Strominger, uh, 22 Molten Road. I, I just had a question. Um, I'm sure they figured it out, but what about the utilities that are going to the house, the gas and the the water main, do those have to be relocated? What do they do with them? That's a good question. Uh, do you, uh, Ms. Van, do you know the location currently of yes. utilities that would be subterranean? Yes, actually the ut utilities will stay in the same location. They are following um, uh, right the, the staircase going up to the house. They come, uh -huh. They're coming along straight, um, landing almost in the middle of the house. Yep. And so they're in this position. So right. they're not a, they're not affected. No. And so even when, even when you move the you're moving the driveway over. Um uh, Mr. Klein, can you scroll down to the updated plan with the um, uh red ink that I sent? So yep. I to switch that. screens for that one. Oh yeah. So they would still be in this position, right? So and um, where it lands in the side of the house, um, it's a little bit more to the left. So it seems like the lines going under that staircase more. Mm -hmm. okay. And so the creation of the retaining wall that would be required on this side that would not interfere with the present location of those utilities. Looking at the plants, it should not. But we'll also we'll have to uh, confirm, obviously, with the dig safe and all that. Make sure the lines are where they are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for concern. Thank you for your question. Um, next on the list uh, is Ian Roth. Oh, hi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I live at 31 Highland, so a couple doors up the hill. Um, my question is, I mean, I just I have some of the concerns that have been mentioned already, but um, and one of them that I have is about the construction. I 
Um, so there's in my basement uh, bedrock coming up um, through a part of the slab. And I, I wondered if there's been any geotechnical evaluation to see well, like how viable it is to remove this. Like we've talked about removing soil, but I'm not sure that's all that's under there. Ms. Ben, has there been a geotech survey to determine the location of stone under there? So we actually, um, when we removed some of the dirt from the basement, working on that, we have, uh, there's no ledge under. And that was obviously our concern because um, what is the four homes, I'm just looking on the street, four homes are so high up. And that also was brought up by the zoning if there is a ledge uh, where we're trying to bring it up. While we're working on the foundation, it's been a, um, just the sand and um, uh, dirt, like dirt. It's it was we did not hit. If we hit the ledge, we would not touch that. Mm -hmm. With this is this is has to be uh, done by professional um, supervised uh, and by hitting the ledge. Obviously, knowing that there's a multiple homes uh, built like that, uh, that it's just not going to be good for anybody. You are very right by bringing mm -hmm. it. And I, so just to make sure I understand then if you were to start the construction of the driveways and you hit a ledge, you would stop that construction? Okay. Um, so then I think my other comment is um, just general about the, the parking in this vicinity, like it's it's clearly an issue. Like, um, is there an alternative that might include a closer parking area to alleviate some of these issues during a snow emergency that have, we've heard about today? And maybe this isn't the right uh, venue for that. But unfortunately, it's not our not our jurisdiction. Okay. The, I think the select board would have that that discretion. Um, certainly, I, I would have imagined the proximity to the high school that um, that might have been an option. Because um, I know there are other communities that do utilize uh, school parking to alleviate on street parking during snow emergencies. Mm -hmm. um, I think if there's other town owned properties, but most I think of the other properties that are in immediate vicinity with the exception of the schools and the DPW yard are all um, are all privately held. Gotcha. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, next on the list is Anna Burgess. Hi, um, I'm at 10 Moulton Road. Um, so we're directly behind the property. Um, Anson Stewart is my uh, upstairs neighbor. Um, I just had a quick question. I just wanted to clarify the it, the only thing that's been approved is interior construction on this property so far. Is that right? Because what Anson was saying about like drainage and you know us wanting to be able to review some sort of plan as far as drainage, we're already a little concerned about that just because we've seen a wall starting to be built that goes right into the back of our garage. And so I just wanted to make sure that, like, I just want a clarification on what's been approved. So we have um, demo and interior renovation of a first and second floor approved. Uh, also the basement work. So uh, there is on site um, small, uh, what is the height? It's at least 30, 30 inches. Um, on the what to what are you referring is 30 inch wall uh, built on site just to uh, level the grading because uh, as you know the lots you probably have the same on your lot is going um, uh, down. So we're going from the left to the right. So th that's something that we uh, just re regraded a little bit and. Uh, building a wall to 30 inches uh, uh, does not require a special permit. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to. Again, and I, I do uh, understand your concern. I'm working with the uh, building department, We're going step by step into this construction without starting anything that is not approved. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to, to check on that and, and clarify. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the question. Um, Mr. Moore, I believe for a second time. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Medeiros uh, had raised her hand first, but lowered it. I don't know if she meant to lower it. She's not spoken yet. No, Ms. Medeiros has spoken. Oh, all right. Not for a, not for a second time, but she did speak for yes, a first for, time. Yes, for a second, uh, a second time, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Steve Piedmont Street. Um, I think uh, from the comments that, that I'm hearing about the wall and such, I, I would suggest that any uh, geotechnical uh, uh, research be done prior to trying to build the parking spaces because once the wall comes down, the wall's down and uh, it's it's too late to put the wall back up, <laughs> particularly if you find ledge. I think you need to try and investigate what is underneath prior to taking the wall down. So if you're not going to be able to do parking, you don't completely uh, turn over that side of the, uh, the, the property as it faces the street. And, and perhaps impacts this street tree. Um, I think there's probably an excellent reason why no one's tried to construct parking spaces on these four houses, I think it was, along this wall. Um, it's a significant amount of construction. I think the sight lines are very poor. I think the concern raised by the neighbors are, uh, are significant in terms of trying to back into a street by parked cars on the neighbor houses without necessarily getting hit by traffic that's moving down or uphill at a very high speed. I, again, I think there's probably good reasons this has not been done a lot. Uh, and lastly, um, by putting in parking spaces, you're going to significantly decrease the open space in front of the house. Um, and I don't, I'm not really that familiar with the amount of uh, usable open space guidelines that are required by the town's uh, zoning rules, but by decreasing the amount of open space, I don't know if it's going to still be in conformance with the zoning requirements for open space for uh, the, the lot size and the plot plan and such. So I think that is something to consider as well uh, by putting in those parking space increase in the open space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, are there any further public comments? And seeing none, so go ahead and close public comment for this evening. Um, so the, the question before the board, um, so it's, it's a request for variance. Yes, sir. Um, we're sort of at a point where there, there may be questions from the board and I, I do have something that, that it might be useful for uh, Ms. Ben before mm -hmm. we get into the analysis. I'm looking at the criteria that we have. And uh, one of them, the second criteria is that a literal enforcement of the provisions of the bylaw would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise to the petitioner and appellant. And the what what is in the planning department memorandum doesn't seem to me really to address that question. And I would like Ms. Ban to take her best shot at showing why it is that literal enforcement uh, of the zoning bylaw requirement here would cause uh, substantial hardship. And I want to sort of emphasize here that substantial hardship does not mean it would be very expensive or difficult to do what you want to do. Uh, substantial hardship means that uh, there's some kind of serious hardship that would come from not being able to do what you want to do. And a lot of the evidence that we have just heard suggests that, in fact, there may not be such substantial hardship. So I'd like to see, I, I would like to hear best shot at, at, the, at what the hardship actually is that would justify a variance. Ms. Ben?
Well, as um, Mr. Hanlon just said, um, not taking into consideration uh, the cost um, and the work that will be involved in that. Um, probably the, the biggest concern is the, um, the stability in building the retaining wall to make sure that uh, structural sound for um, the property itself and the concern of neighbors, um, especially to the right. Uh, the uh, family Medeiros family, uh, as she has vo voiced her concern, I, I would I would say that would probably will be the uh, the biggest concern. Thank you. Is there a further question, Mr. Hanlon? No, sir, that, that takes care of number two. Okay. So the question for the board, so this is a, um, as we said, this is a variance request. Um, so there are four criteria that the board needs to address um, in its evaluation. Um, whether there is circumstances relating to the um, the soil conditions, topography, or shape, which especially affects the slander structure in question, but does not generally affect the district. Um, and then the literal, as Mr. Hanlon just said, the literal enforcement of the provisions. Questions of all substantial hardship, financial or otherwise. Um, and then how relief can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good, and how desirable relief can be granted without nullifying or substantially um, derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw. Um, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Yes, uh, Mr. DuPont. So I am trying to, it seems like the more that we get variance requests, sometimes the trickier they become. And so, I mean, I'm used to the sorts of variances where if you have a, an oddly shaped lot and the house is situated in such a way that if somebody wants to put an addition on, they can't, uh, they can't do it because it's too close to the lot line, uh, say the side yard lot line, due to the fact of the odd shape of the lot. So those are sort of the more everyday types of circumstances we run into, where if somebody wanted to build a garage, but there was some sort of ledge and they would have to say, move again over toward the lot line. I mean, those seem to be a little bit more straightforward. Um, you know, I have a question really for Mr. Valarelli through the chair, which is if this lot were not on a hill, if it were not sloped, if it was just a flat piece of land, given where the house is in relationship to the lot line, and I'm thinking as you're looking from the street to the right-hand side, uh, is there space enough to the side of the house to have the parking? And again, forget the slope uh, and the hill, but if, is there sufficient room to the side of the house to have the parking that you would normally want? Yeah, there is, Mr. DuPont, there's plenty of room. Okay. Uh, again, the slope, um, notwithstanding, did I hear you correctly on that? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. there's flat. So, yeah, correct. There's, there's plenty of room. And so as I look at this too, um, I think one thing that's important to note is there's no requirement for off-street parking here. I mean, the people have permit parking. And so in one sense, it's not a requirement that there be any parking on the property whatsoever. So that is in some ways to me a bit, it needs to be noted. And then the other part of this is uh, in that first paragraph where it says that the condi soil condition, shape or topography especially affect the land, but do not affect generally the zoning district. Uh, that part of it is a concern for me too, because I know Highland Avenue very well. 
And as has been noted, there are actually four houses uh, situated similarly. And so to me, in a way, this is a matter of convenience as opposed to necessity. And not that that's part of the variance calculation, but I'm not sure that it satisfies that part where it says that he, there are conditions that affect this parcel, but don't affect generally the zoning district just by the very presence of those additional three houses. So those are my concerns when looking at this application. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I come at it from a slightly different way than Pond, but I think I'm not very far ultimately from where from where he is. We have had occasion sometimes in the past to deal with situations where there was a problem in a row of several houses um, that were not with that. So that the problem of the one property I'm thinking of a uh, one up in Westminster Avenue, um, where there where certainly it wasn't unique to this parcel, but it wasn't certainly wasn't generally shared in the zoning district, uh, which after all was uh, was, a, was a very broad concept anyway. Um, but that being said, so I'd be reluctant to go that way uh, for me, just because I think that we're already, we've already gone that way and, and not taken that strict a view of what the, or of what the zoning district is. I do think that that probably there's a topography issue here, and that if a zoning, if a variance were otherwise uh, advisable, that they'd meet the first criterion, which is not always the case, as we know. Uh, but I don't think there's any. I don't think there's unreasonable hardship here, and the reason there's no unreasonable hardship here is that it's not an unreasonable hardship not to have this parking space, and that's exactly where I think I agree with with Mr. Dupont. The underlying thing isn't that it's so expensive to do what you want to do that you won't be able to do it. It's what you want to do is sufficiently important that you're not being able to do it is a substantial hardship. Uh, here, it's clear that the applicant could go either way. If we don't grab it, if, if they don't get a variance from us, they've already thought that they'll work with Mr. Valorelli towards designing things in a different way. And, uh, you know, uh, this isn't the kind of hardship that is is envisioned by uh, the variant statute. Uh, I think we've also had a lot of evidence that in fact, there might very well be a substantial detriment uh, to uh, the neighborhood. Certainly some of the advantages uh, like getting cars off the street is it will not be achieved because they only get one car off the street. Um, and so between the set, number two and number three, I just don't think we're there for a variance. Variances are very hard to get, and uh, we're pretty strict on what these what the interpretation of these things are. And I think that the applicant has a plan B. I think they will do fine with their plan B, and I think that they should go to plan B. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Are there other comments from the board? Mr. Chair? Mr. O'Rourke? I would concur with Mr. DuPont, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you. Yes, I. For me, the the real question is is number three. Um, so I, I I do live in this neighborhood. I live uh, higher up the hill, so I do walk back and forth um, along this sidewalk. Um, and certainly, you know, you, probably four or five years ago, there was a section of the retaining wall farther up the street that was in danger of collapse, um, and that was repaired, but sort of walking up and down the street often and sort of, I, I think it would be, you know, the, I understand the desire to, to have parking off street that it, you know, it does make things um, easier and safer. I think there's, there are definitely some issues with creating a parking space um, of this type. Uh, number one is, is the stability, you know, it's generating this stability. I'm sure, um, you know, Mr. Ford on the on our board could certainly speak to the ability to create, um, such structures that would be suitable. Um, but one of my concerns is where does the snow go? Uh, when you have to shovel out those spaces, there's really very little place to put snow now because you can't shovel it to the sides. 
because you can't get it up over the over the top. So it's got to go out um, towards the street or towards the you know the, the small uh, grassy verge between the sidewalk and the street. Um, and there's the sight lines. It is just it's a very very difficult thing that you if you were to pull in forward to that parking space, you cannot find your way back out again. Um, and even if you were to be able to, you know, if, even if you did back in, um, you know, pulling out your view is gonna be, you've got a narrow view slot before you're occluded by the cars that are parked on the street. So I just, I'm, I'm very concerned about the, the potential safety hazards um, for finding cars, let alone finding, you know, pedestrians who use this street. And as was uh, put forward, the um, the various track teams that that use this use this street among other joggers and walkers and and all other members of the public. Um, so I think I would have a very difficult time to describe how this relief could be granted without a, without a substantial detriment to the public good. Thank you, Mr. Klein. As uh, you were talking about the safety um, uh, installation of mirrors, as um, I know um, uh, a lot of uh, places do. And um, I also had a comment on the retaining wall. Regardless, this retaining wall in front of the property as it is right now, um, at, at this particular property, 25 Highland Ave, will have has to be um, worked on substantially as we can see on the pictures. Um, and that is the plan um, to have that reinforced if there will be no parking um, allowed um, together with the steps going up to the property as um, those are out of level that has to be all fixed. Okay. And I'm sure all the neighbors uh, uh, from the left and to the right uh, that do have this large retaining walls, uh, that's something that has to be addressed. I think it's 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 only four homes on the Highland Avenue that um sitting this high up, because the the last the last property um, on Highland Avenue to the right from uh, Madeira's family, they do have a pretty long driveway in, and um I think that uh, that property actually has a huge retaining wall from from Madeira's side as well. So only four of us don't have a parking. Any further discussion from the board? Certainly my, my sense from hearing from um, Mr. Stupon Hanlon and O'Rourke. Um, I'm not, not certain that a motion to proceed to approve a variance for 25 Highland would be successful. Um, so we can either propose a motion and proceed, or if the applicant would rather. Um, withdraw, we could entertain that as well. Just the, the issue is that if the board votes and denies, then it's a, it's a two year before you can apply again. This is a question for the, for the applicant. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have, I have a question here that um, might impact, I, I need to raise this because it might impact the um, applicant's um, decision about okay. So she may reappear before the board 
or some DOM is uh, something possibly in the future. Um, so that being said, um, can she reappear before the board if you uh, vote this down, even um, on another matter? Or is that um, a blanket coverage, if you will? Or, be or because she is requesting something entirely different, uh, does that exempt her from the two year wait period? That is a very good question. I just don't want to see the applicant get caught here. No, absolutely. Uh, so it's three to five repetitive petitions, no appeal or petition for a variance from the terms of this bylaw denied by the Board of Appeals or a special permit denied by either the Board of Appeals or the Redevelopment Board shall be considered again on its merits within two years from after the date of denial, except under the following circumstances, at least all but one member of the Redevelopment Board votes to allow the refiling or the board that denied the initial application then finds by unanimous vote of a board of three or vote of four out of five. Um, specific and material changes in the conditions upon which the previous unfavorable action was based. So it does sound like it is um, specific to the previous request. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, they may be appearing before the board for some uh it's a lack of usable open space possibly thank you for that okay. explanation thank you so with that should we should the board entertain a motion in regards to this matter so mr chairman mr hanlon um just to be clear about it, I wonder if 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 we could just hear from Ms. Ban one way or the other what her preference is. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, but I will immediately obviously uh, I need to submit the permit to True Word address. That, um, can you hear me? Yep. No, we can. Yes. So there's a few few important things that I have to address immediately. Uh, first, the submission to the tree ward of um, uh, address the tree situation on the lot at this uh, particular uh, moment. Um, we are also I made a note of uh, getting a geotechnical research first um, to the property to understand if uh, there's a ledge or not in this and if that really will be possible at the end of the day. And um, visibility issue is the big one for all the neighbors and the board. Um, and I wanna look into the uh, mitigation um, of ways of uh, mitigating that and making it safer. Um, it is only for homes that don't have um, the parking Yes, it may only take two cars out of the um, street. However, um, it is only four properties that don't have parking, and uh, the other property at the beginning of the street has a parking, uh, has a driveway, and other uh, homes going up the street do have a parking um, on site. So that that small stretch uh, without a driveways. I do understand it is a safe stretch without anybody backing in, backing out. Um, <clears throat> by after doing all this and consulting with the geotechnical um, research and making sure we, we do have ways of getting visibility solved, um, plus getting structural plan for a uh, retaining wall. That would be a possibility of getting that parking from the property. Well, I think that addresses concern number, uh, addresses criteria number three, but I think there were substantial questions in regards to criteria number two, which is whether the literal enforcement of the provision of the zoning ordinance involves a substantial hardship and is there a substantial hardship in 
not having two parking spaces in the front yard when you already have two parking spaces on the street. On the street, understand. As I did say in my application, it is, um, you know, big, big inconvenience, obviously. Uh, I don't want to say it's at first, uh, first safety uh, for whoever will be uh, living after renovation in this property. And uh, to summarize, really, this is not a, a lot, first project we're doing in Watertown. It's, and it's probably not the last one um, as a builder. We did a great job um, and all we're doing is to have as convenient and as uh, besides having a beautiful home, uh, just a comfortable space for families to live in. And as I was reading through the bylaws, the purpose of the bylaws is to promote health, safety, convenience and morals, welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Arlington. So um, I was taking it from in that direction Again, I will uh, respect the decision of the board one way or the other. Um, just trying to get a nice property down for the future families to live in. As comfortable as we can get. So for the Zoning Board of Arlington, um, do we want to proceed with a vote at this time or do we want to, do we feel we need to um, continue and allow the applicant to uh, research the questions in regarding the, the tree, the geotechnical, and uh, finding ways to improve the visibility of the site. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Hanlon first, yes. Um, I, I can only say that all of those things to relate to criterion three, which I thought was were questioned. Uh, and they were ably described by others, um, but I'm still stuck on criterion two, and it's unlikely that anything that the applicant would do in investing more time and resources in investigating this would change my view of the disposition of the case. Mr. Hanlon, Mr. O'Rourke? I am likewise still stuck on criteria two, but I'm also stuck on three as well, Mr. S Mr. Chair. Thank you. The research would, uh, or that information they want to get would change that. Mr. Okay. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So, um, and I appreciate Mr. Hanlon's remarks earlier about uh, criteria, uh, criterion one. I still have some questions about that, but I do agree that two is more problematic. Uh, three, perhaps somewhat problematic, but I think it's the applicant's decision to either ask for the vote or to ask to continue because I think the applicant has a right to come back and ask for us to consider it you know despite mm -hmm. any of the things that we've said today to see if those might influence uh, those criteria so uh, I think it's it's really the applicant's decision at this point Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So then I guess I'll, the, the question then before the, the board, which will uh, request, you know, ask the, the applicant how they would want to proceed is whether the applicant is looking for us to proceed to a vote at this time, or if the applicant is seeking a continuance to do further research. If it's possible, I'd like to get uh, more research done and be um, prepared with the plans and um, analysis of the lot. Um, so Mr. Valerelli, so we have currently a hearing scheduled for December 21st. Um, where we have three cases that are on the docket already. And then earlier this evening, we have continued two additional cases to that evening. So that brings us up to a total of five. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. 
have we set any dates out beyond the 21st of January? We have uh, 21st of December. 21st of December, thank you. Yeah, no, we have not. Uh, we have uh, many cases um, almost ready to go, but we have not set any dates beyond the 21st of December at this time. Okay, I'm just nervous about adding a sixth case to that evening. Um, first date in January, I believe that we would be scheduling for is Tuesday, January 11th. Mr. Klein, if that helps, um, I would prefer to go if possible, probably in January to be totally prepared and make sure that I do get research done. Okay. Uh, depending on the vendors and how I can turn this around. That would, that would certainly be very helpful. Um, so the Tuesday, January 11th, that would not be too far out for you? That should be fine. Then I would afford a motion to continue uh, the variance hearing for 25 Highland Avenue to Tuesday. January 11th, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Second. Dupont. Seconded. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, so vote of the board, Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. Chair votes aye. We are continued on 25 Highland Avenue. Thank you, Ms. Bannon. Thank you to uh, all the uh, abutters and neighbors for coming out this evening. I appreciate your patience. Thank you very much, everybody. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just for a minute, I'd, I'd like to congratulate Ms. Bannon for she a lot of technical information and one of the more informative type of presentations that I've seen. She's she's done a good job and whatever problems there are in this case have to do with the underlying facts and not with her presentation, which I thought was excellent. Thank you for that, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Appreciate it. Next on the Agenda, agenda item number six, docket 3675, 137 Robbins Road. Uh, greatly appreciate the, the applicant's patience as we move through all the cases this evening. Um, so if I could ask the, ask the applicant to introduce herself and tell us what she would like to do. Hi, um, my name is Ji Zhao. And I live in the 137 Robbins Road. And the reason I'm here is um, we propose an addition. It's a little bit larger than 750 square feet. Uh, and also we want to enclose the front porch. So this is uh, for both, we apply for the special permit. Uh, our house is uh, really small. We have, uh, we only have uh, two bedrooms and the one bathroom. And then we have one, we have four people live in this house. So we have one boy and the one girl, the 15 years old and the 13 years old. So they both need their own bedrooms. So our proposal is adding one extra bedrooms and the two um, bathrooms. Uh, and the, by the way, our house is the smallest one in the neighborhood. Uh, and we, we live here more than 15 years. And we kind of have one point, we're thinking to looking for the, another place, kind of move away from here. And the, at the end, we decide to stay here because we, we do love this neighborhood very much. So we hope we can just, you know, stay able to stay here and uh, expand the house a little bit to fit our needs. 
Um, so the current edition, actually we meet all the requirements for the setbacks and the heights. But the only thing is a little bit bigger than kind of 750 square feet. And then on the top, we add in one bedroom on the second level. I, we want to use kind of an attic for my own kind of the little office there. Because for now, I'm working at the office, at the home. So I do not have any place to work. So I use our kind of a dining room now to work. So that's the whole reason we hope to add in, to use up the space on the attic to, you know, that adds up the square footage over 750. So that's why we're here today. Thank you. And then it, you had said in the front, that, so there's currently an open deck at the front that you're enclosing as a mudroom. That's correct. Okay. The, our entrance in the front now is like a three by three feet. It, it's uh, very small. So we don't have uh, closets. We do not have a uh, kind of just uh, basically nothing there. So we need a mud room to put our uh, stuff there. So that's uh, pretty much. But uh, we have is open deck. So the idea is we just close this up. Um, oops, let's see so far. Okay, so the plans here are in front of us. So this is the demolition plans. Uh, we have basement and first floor. So this is the extent of the current um, front porch that would be enclosed. Yeah, it's kind of, a, yeah, it's a, around the same location of a front porch. We kind of close. Mm -hmm. So the idea is there. Okay, and then just ex the expansion then is on the side and the rear is the main. That's correct. Addition. That's correct. So it's on the, the side addition here on the first floor is only on the first floor, the second floor is open deck. The, um, the mud room is only a single story. And then at the rear of the house, um, at the second floor level, is the, the master suite. And then as she mentioned, the, the attic floor um, at the top of the house would be the, um, the, off, the office or studio space up here, which would have a small deck right. as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and the, the reason for the, for the roof, we can, you know, again, this house is really small. And we kind of like to add in the solar panel on top of a roof. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're making the roof like a pitch roof on the one side. So that side, we can face into the sun. And the second, they can kind of maximize the size of the roof. Otherwise, we don't have kind of a space to put on. Mm -hmm. So then, so this is the rear elevation. Correct, yeah. The house, this is the side facing down, the sort of the, the north side facing Mass Ave. Mm -hmm. This one. Um, and then this is the street elevation, so that this is the current existing house, and then this is the first, the, the main addition, and this is the modern addition. Yes. And, and this is the uphill side, the south side of the house. Um, so are there changes being made to the, the siding of the existing house or is, the, is, uh, is, the, is it just the addition that's going to no. be new? It's just an addition. We don't touch the existing house for, for now. Okay. And then is there, uh, what are the materials that you're proposing to the, have on the, the, the hardy boards. So we're thinking of that. Mm -hmm. So kind of still working on the materials. It depends on the cost, I would say. 
but that we're trying to kind of uh, match more close with our surroundings. Mm -hmm. So it appears because the, the addition appears to be very modern as opposed to the, the house, which appears to be much more traditional. Yes. And then the, I saw you had added, you have windows on the mudroom, which was a question that had been raised by the planning department when they first reviewed the plans. Um, and then the only question I had on the exterior here, so the, um, the addition is really sort of an independent piece that sort of clips onto the roof here. It's very independent here. Um, on the front, it definitely has a very different appearance. The, my only question is here on the side where this wall sort of morphs between the addition. On one side, this, this piece is part of the addition. And on this side of the house, it's part of the, it's part of the old house. It's sort of being done like the old house. Yeah. Um, so, what, yeah. We, we we are for this part here. We're going to kind of mm -hmm. continue with the kind of exist existing facade materials, and uh, just for now, we kind of propose with kind of now. But in the future, we may kind of update the our old kind of the house or facade. Maybe in the future, but uh, for for now, we just propose what we show here. Um, and then here we have a couple of sections through. So this is the, through the addition. Um, this is that, as the epithet said, this is the, the large slope that faces south, which mm -hmm. could be utilized for solar. And then this okay. is sectioning in the opposite direction, showing the staircase coming from the second floor level up to the attic floor level. Right. Are there questions from the board? None at the moment. Um, go ahead and open for uh, public questions and comment. Um, again, if you would like to, um, to speak, if you can digitally raise your hand using the reactions tab, um, or if you're on phone, dial star nine. Um, and the first on our list is Mr. Moore. Yes, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I seem to be speaking on every case tonight, I'm feeling overly verbose. Um, I, I, uh, I would just like to comment first on, on uh, compliment the applicant on their sort of imaginative um, um, approach to dealing with a, a significant space problem. Um, uh, this is this is kind of a different construction style, and I have to say, initially, I was put off by it. But in in looking at it repeatedly, I'm thinking now, it's uh, it's an interesting interesting new design. I think I might, from a stylistic point of view, not probably decrease all the vertical lines uh, because they clash with the horizontal lines of the existing either shakes or collaborating. I can't I can't quite tell it. Um, um, and maybe the design guidelines might help some of the siding issues which uh, the applicant is considering in terms of dealing with uh, dealing with the two styles. But uh, but I do want to compliment them on their imaginative solution. Um, uh, secondarily, as a tree committee member, um, I did want to ask a question about the trees on the property. It's hard to tell um, what's going on in the backyard there from the aerial photographs. Are there currently mature trees on the lot? Can I? Uh, yeah, can I answer the question? Yes, please do. If you move down, I think we have one area photos from the uh, kind of the document you upload for this application. Uh, we, we keep all the trees on the side. We're not going to touch any of that. And then on the back, we have currently, we have one kind of a low almost like a bush, it's like a bush. It's not really like a tree, it's a between tree and the bush. So that we're going to remove. 
I, but for the other trees, we don't, we're not going to move in any trees on the side. Let's say the bigger trees is all stay. We, but we're going to trim, kind of trim makes us not uh, spreading that far to touch the building. But uh, we love to keep all the trees there. Mr. Chairman, that's, that's excellent news. I, um, uh, the only trees that are affected by the bylaw are in the setbacks and they're eight inches or greater. Um, I'm very happy to hear that trees are being, um, being maintained. And I would just suggest again that during construction, I'm not sure if you're going to need to use the open space that's there, but you protect the critical root zone around the mature trees um, and uh, the tree warden can help you with that. Do you have a, do you currently have a tree plan? As I asked the earlier, just tonight. No, we, we don't have a tree plan. Um, I think probably you need to get in touch with the tree warden. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether or not this uh, particular job activates the bylaw. I believe it does because it's a certain percentage increase to your footprint. Um, just and, and the only purpose of the tree plant would be to uh, register that uh, your trees on the property and talk about the critical root zone protection with the tree warden. It, it's something which uh, you probably do need to accomplish before you move forward. Okay, I think we can do that. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Any further questions from the public? Do not see any. Let's go ahead and close public comment. Um, Further questions from the board? I think it's a the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development in their um, in their review they had. Um, let's see, what did they, plan, which they have already incorporated some of, uh, overall, they maintain that owing to the small parcel size and the placement of a portion of the current driveway with pervious surface reduction in propo proportion of usable open space is acceptable and is consistent with the zoning bylaw. Concerns about aesthetics, usable open space, and tree plan be satisfied that DPCD recommends approval. There are aesthetic concerns. They were concerned about um, in the original plan, the mudroom didn't have windows, um, and those have been added. And they're also concerned about the, um, the high number of different roof surfaces, um, which you know is not in keeping with the original style of the house, but I think is. Um, somewhat in keeping with the the style of the proposal. Um, I know if, if Mr. Mills was here, he would probably be a little concerned about where the, how the water is going to flow. Um, but I think the applicant's in a position to address that. Um, there's, there aren't any places that appear to sort of trap, uh, no. trap flowing water or trapping snow. Wait, wait. Um, yeah. uh, and then the, the other thing they had question was the was whether a tree plant was required and as Mr. Moore said that's something that can be worked out with the with the tree warden and it's something that the so that the uh, building department would be looking for as a part of the application process anyways mm -hmm. um, any for anything further from the board? If not, the we can entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, just one moment. We have our three standard uh, conditions. We haven't actually had an opportunity yet to make a motion on any case tonight. Um, but I, I wonder 
A, if, if maybe we need to explain what the standard conditions are as we usually do in our first case of the night. And secondly, uh, are there any other conditions that members of the board uh, feel are appropriate? I, I can say that, that I don't have any in my mind. So, uh, uh, so without more, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Then, um, so the, the Sister Hannah noted the board has three standard conditions, which it applies um, to special permits. Um, the first is that the final plans and specifications approved by the board for the permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. Should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. So just that what we are approving tonight is what we're expecting you to build. And if you're planning to make changes, you need to let us know before you make them. Um, Number two is the building inspector is hereby notified that he's to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time he determines that violations are present. And the inspector of buildings shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the inspector of buildings may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1, um, which is just that, um, you know, that the construction will occur, will occur by the law. Um, and then if there are issues, this is how they resolve. And then uh, condition number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant, which is just that after the issuance of the special permit, the board still has jurisdiction in regards to what we, the portion of the project that we are approving. Um, the things that the, Department of Planning and Community Development had mentioned um, the tree plant. I think uh, Mr. Valarelli would agree that that will be handled um, as a matter of course. Um, and I do not believe if apart from the Asked for an yard setback. Addition being a large addition, I don't think there were any further um, issues. The only other condition I would recommend recently, which is uh, I have a better version of it right now. I've written already. Um, it's essentially that uh, the addition of a mud room to the front of the building. Should not be considered within the building footprint. Or excuse me, the within the foundation wall. Term. Basically, what that just means is that the, there are parts of the zoning bylaw that relate to the location of the foundation wall, which is the front wall of the house. And so because the, uh, the proposed mudroom will stick out in front of that, we are saying that that does not establish a new line of the front of the house in front of the current location. Anything? Okay. Are there any further? Seeing none. It's then we, Mr. Hanlon? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, did you call on me or is there another I one? I did. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that the uh, board approve the application before us subject to the uh, three standard conditions and the fourth room relating to the position of the foundation wall. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Any discussion of the proposed motion? Hearing none, a vote of the board. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. 
Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. The chair votes aye. Uh, the special permit for 137 Robbins Road with the four conditions is, is approved. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank Good you. Good luck. Patience this <laughs> evening. Okay, thank you. So, that in mind, um, so upcoming meetings, um, there's a meeting on Tuesday, December 21st, so the board has a good long period of rest. Um, and then after that, we now have a meeting on Tuesday, January 11th. Those are our next two hearing dates. Just to, uh, to really raise some stuff from last night. Um, so now having uh, concluded tonight's hearing, we have two other board members who are looking for um, stepping down from the board. Uh, Aaron Ford, our, our second associate member who joined us in April 2020 is now stepping down from the board, um, having served in by far the craziest time I think the board has ever seen. Um, greatly appreciate his patience and uh, participation in, in everything uh, over the last uh, year and a half. It's really greatly appreciated. And uh, Sean O'Rourke is also leaving us as a member. Um, he had joined the board as an associate in April of 2017 and was, became a full member in September of that same year. He's also leaving the board as of tonight's meeting. Uh, it's been a tremendous Pleasure having him with us for the last four and a half years. We really appreciate his service with the board. So thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been a pleasure. Very both very welcome. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you guys. We'll miss you. Well, Absolutely. Likewise. Thanks to everyone else for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially would like to thank uh, Rick Dallarelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Linema for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting our online meetings. Uh, please note the purpose of the board's recording of this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI um, will, uh, first understand the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. And if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email uh, to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA's website. And then to conclude tonight's hearing, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, I'd like to make one comment before you take the vote to adjourn. Sir. Um, in just uh, hearing uh, Mr. O'Wan's comment about it's been a pleasure, I'm not sure that uh, he might look at the past year as a as a pleasure of the four years that he served. Um, I've sat through many of the meetings related to both Thorndike Place and, and uh, 1065 Arbmass Ave. Um, and I just wanted to express uh, my appreciation for all of you board members, to include Mr. Revelak, unfortunately, who's not here tonight, um, for all the hard work that you've done and the way you've been able to approach this whole series of issues and many, many public opinions on the 40B applications and all the other things that are going on this year um, with equanimity and a little bit of humor and patience. I, I've been very impressed by what I've seen in the board since I started to attend the meetings. I mean, it's after 11 o'clock now, and this was a regular night, supposedly, after last night, <laughs> their irregular <laughs> night. Um, the schedule has been extreme, and um, folks forget the people that come before you for one or two nights forget that this is all a volunteer effort on your part, um, some of which are a love of town, some of which are a love of uh, sort of advocation, but honestly, it's a, it's a ton of work, and uh, I just want to thank you guys for all the work that you do, the retiring members, the current members that are, that are continuing on. I've been so impressed by what I've seen, so... Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Moore. Really appreciate that, Mr. Moore. Okay. With that, we will ask for a motion to adjourn. So, moved. so second. Mm -hmm. 
A vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Good night, guys. Good night, guys. Have Good night, night everybody. Guys. You have a great Thanksgiving. All right. Yeah, Thanks, everybody. Everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye, Rick.